She is co-hosted by the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, Regional Center for Asia and the Pacific, the Minister of Justice of the Republic of Korea, and Incheon Metropolitan City. Additionally, this forum would not have been possible without the valued support of the Incheon Tourism Organization, POSCO International, the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center, the Korea Trade Network, PKU Law, and the International Chamber of Commerce Digital Standards Initiative. I am Han Gyeol Kim, legal expert at Uncitra RCAP, on second month from Minister of Justice, Republic of Korea. It is my great pleasure to be one of your moderators for, the, for this forum. We are honored to have speakers from different parts of the world participating in our two-day hybrid event. The theme of this forum is From Documents to Data, Legal and Commercial Solutions for Digital Trade. Over the course of these two days, representatives from the legal, business, and public sectors will explore the promotion of law reform and business development in support of digital trade across the Asia-Pacific region with special attention on UNCITRA instruments. Before beginning today's event, we remind all participants of some housekeeping matters. This event is being recorded and will be posted on the UNCITRA event webpage along with the presentation slides with the consent of the speakers in due course. The program and speaker bio notes can also be found on the web page. Our events facilitators will be posting links to relevant material, including UNCITRA text in the chat box throughout the event. For our panelists, please remain muted with your cameras turned off unless you're speaking. Please also turn on your cameras for group photo captures. The first group photo will be taken at the end of the keynote speeches. I respectfully request our esteemed opening speakers to approach the stage. Following this, we will be inviting all on-site attendees to join us at the front for a group photo. At the end of each session, group captures will be taken for each panel at the prompt of your moderator. The virtual participants photo shall be taken first, followed by the on-site participants. In-person participants viewing on their laptop should remain muted to avoid echoes. Thank you to those who have submitted advanced questions. Additional questions are welcome via the Q&A box and will be addressed during the Q&A session at the end of each panel. Speakers can also request the floor using raising your hand function on Zoom. Due to time limitations, panels may not be able to address all questions. If you have technical issues, please write in the Q&A box or email on citra.rcap at gmail.com. Thank you. To start off the forum, it is our great honor to receive opening remarks from Mr. Ku sang -yeop, Deputy Minister for Legal Affairs of the Minister of Justice of the Republic of Korea. As Mr. Gu could not be present with us today, his opening remarks will kindly be read on his behalf by Mr. Taeyong Kim, Director for International Legal Policy of the Minister of Justice, Republic of Korea. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Kim. Kibinyorobanyawashimika, 포럼의 성공적 개최를 위해 지원을 아끼지 않으신 모든 후원 기관에도 감사의 말씀을 전합니다. 특히 바쁘신 가운데 행사에 참석해 주신 정부, 학계, 재계, 국제기구 전문가 여러분 그리고 실시간 방송을 통해 함께하시는 모든 분들께 깊은 감사의 말씀을 전합니다. 
이번 포럼의 주제는 문서에서 데이터로 디지털 무역을 위한 법률 및 비즈니스 솔루션입니다. 이번 포럼이 디지털 무역 관련 국제거래 규범 확립 및 전자양도성 기록 모델법에 대한 논의를 통해 국제 무역의 디지털화에 한 걸음 더 나아가는 유용한 장이 되기를 바랍니다. 바야흐로 디지털 대전환의 시대입니다. 4차 산업혁명은 디지털 전환 가속화를 통해 국제 무역의 생태계도 변화시키고 있습니다. 전자상거래라는 새로운 형태의 비즈니스는 거래 방식의 패러다임 변화를 통해 무역 규모 확대로 이루어졌, 이루어, 이어졌으며 전자양도성 기록 등 무역 문서의 전자화는 무역의 질적 메커니즘을 바꾸고 있습니다. 디지털 무역의 이러한 양적 질적 변화에 맞추어 전 세계는 디지털 무역, 국경 간 디지털 무역을 규율하는 공통의 규범을 마, 마련하고자 노력해 왔습니다. WTO 전자상거래 협상 및 개별 지역 차원에서 제, 체결되고 있는 각종 디지털 통상 협정들이 그 예입니다. 대한민국도 디지털 경제 선진국으로서 지난해 최초의 디지털 통상 협정인 한국 싱가포르 디지털 동반자 협정을 체결하는 등 디지털 무역 규범 확립을 위한 세계적 조류에 동참하고 있습니다. 이러한 흐름 속에 인시트랄은 보다 기술적인 측면의 디지털 무역 규범 연구에 주목해 왔습니다. 그 결과 지난 2017년 채택된 전자양도성 기록 모델법은 무역 서류의 상징인 선하증권의 전자화에 관한 글로벌 스탠다드를 제시한 귀중한 성과입니다. 무역 디지털화는 거스를 수 없는 시대적인 흐름이며 유례없는 팬데믹 이후 침체된 세계 경제에 활기를 불어넣을 수 있는 좋은 기회입니다. 디지털 무역 활성화의 법적 기반을 다지기 위해 글로벌 스탠다드 도입과 전파에 역량을 모아야 할 때입니다. 이번 포럼에서 논의될 전자양도성 기록 모델법과 디지털 무역 규범들이 글로벌 디지털 무역의 새로운 지평을 여는 법률적 총매제가 되기를 바라며 오늘과 내일 이틀간 행사에서 건설적인 제안과 심도 있는 토론이 이루어지기를 기대합니다. 한편 이번 포럼은 법무부와 인천시, 웅시트라리 공동 주최하는 뜻깊은 자리이기도 합니다. 지난 2012년에 웅시트랄 최초의 지역사무소인 알캡이 인천 송도에 자리 잡은 이래로 법무부, 인천시, 웅시트랄 알캡은 아시아 태평양 지역 국제 거래 규범 발전을 위해 여러 방면에서 협력해 왔습니다. 특히 디지털화, 팬데믹 같은 급변하는 글로벌 거래 환경 속에 법무부와 인천시, 웅시트랄 알캡은 파트너십을 맺고 영내 회원국들의 법제 정비 지원과 영양 강화에 있어 핵심적인 역할을 해왔습니다. 웅시트랄 아태 지역 사무소가 대한민국 정부와 함께 아시아 태평양 지역 국가들의 법제도 발전에 긍정적인 영향을 주고 있음을 매우 자랑스럽게 생각하며 법무부도 지속적인 협력을 통해 국제 무역 질서의 확립과 전파에 기여할 수 있도록 노력할 것입니다. 내외 귀빈 여러분, 아무쪼록 인천 로엔 비즈니스 포럼이 참석하는 모든 분들께 의미 있는 시간이 되기를 바라며 여기 계시는 모든 분들의 건강과 안전을 기원합니다. 감사합니다. Thank you very much, Mr. Kim, to deliver, for delivering the opening remarks of the Deputy Minister. Next, we are honored to introduce the Mayor of Incheon Metropolitan City, Republic of Korea, Mr. Yu Jong-bo, to deliver his welcoming speech. Although Mr. Yu could not be present with us today, he has provided us with a pre-recorded video. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Yu Jong-bo, Mayor of Incheon Metropolitan City, Republic of Korea. It's a great pleasure to meet you all. Let me extend my sincere congratulations on the third Incheon Law and Business Forum. My special thanks go to Secretary Anna Jubinbure of Union Citral, Gu sang Deputy Minister for Legal Affairs of the Ministry of Justice, and 
Atita Komindoru, head of ancestral RCAP for joining us today. As you know, this forum is themed with from document to data, legal and commercial solutions for digital trade. Over the past three years, the pandemic has changed so many things. Above all, with business rapidly going digital, the paradigm is also shifting from traditional to digital trade. Last year, the global e-commerce market size surpassed $3.5 trillion and is expected to grow over 15% annually through 2026. In Korea, as many consumers purchase goods directly from overseas online shipping malls, the number of personal customs clearance code issued has reached 220 million. South Korea has alleged the sixth largest e-commerce market on the globe. While the world is competing to take the lead in the e-commerce market, Incheon is playing a key role in global e-commerce by leveraging its solid infrastructure, such as the world-renowned airport and seaport. Still, there are numerous challenges that need improvements and changes in order to survive this fierce global competition. In this sense, today's forum is a valuable platform for you to exchange insight and explore ideas to innovate the legal system to prepare for the future of Korea. I sincerely hope this forum will pave the way to formulate globally uniform regulations for our mutual development. In turn, we'll carefully listen to today's discourse and actively promote various projects in cooperation with the Ministry of Justice and UNCITRA. We'll also work hard to contribute to the international community by supporting the legal system improvement related to international trade law. I hope everyone finds this forum meaningful and wish you all good health and a safe stay in Incheon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Yu. Finally, join me in welcoming Ms. Anna Jubin Brett. Secretary of UNCITRAL, who will deliver co-opening remarks on behalf of UNCITRAL. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Anna with a big round of applause. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon for those who are listening to us online and good evening for those who are still to begin the week. Deputy Minister Ku and uh, through Director Keon Kim, Mayor Yu, distinguished guests, friends of Ancitral. It's my great honor on behalf of the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law to join our partners in opening the 2023 Incheon Law and Business Forum. The ILBF, as we call it in the UN, we like our acronyms. The ILBF is a flagship event for Ancitral and its regional center for Asia and the Pacific. And I offer my special thanks to the Ministry of Justice of the Republic of Korea and to the Incheon Metropolitan City for their enduring support in making it happen. This third installment establishes the forum as a fixture in the legal landscape of the region. And what a thrill it is to be able to open it in person again, and to be here with you in this thriving and dynamic city. It is one of the most highly attended iterations thus far. We have over 350 participants joining us online and here 
in person from all over the world, Africa, Europe, the Americas, and all corners of Asia and the Pacific. The ILBF was conceived as an interactive platform for legal, policy, and business experts to discuss the new dimensions of trade and investment where legal harmonization may be desirable. The inaugural forum in 2019, which addressed the theme of challenges of doing business in the digital economy in Asia and the Pacific, presented insights and ideas that have helped us shape the exploratory work being undertaken at that time by the Antitrust Secretariat on the legal issues of the digital economy. Participants at that inaugural forum highlighted the risk of legal fragmentation that could arise if states were to formulate different policies and legal responses to the emerging technologies that were transforming how businesses engaged in trade. It was suggested that an international legal framework enabling the use of digital signatures across borders and one addressing restrictions on cross-border data flows and data sharing would be particularly useful. It is only too fitting that this year's forum should return to digital transformation in addressing the theme from documents to data, legal and commercial solutions to digital trade. While this theme has allowed us to structure a two-track program of work that features an impressive lineup of distinguished speakers from across government and industry, it presents an auspicious and very useful occasion for us to inform you about recent milestones at Ancitral in its digital economy work and how prescient those earlier discussions within this forum turned out to be. Ancitral has a proud tradition in this area. Over the last three decades, it has developed a suite of legislative texts on electronic commerce, as the area has traditionally been known, which have been adopted in over 100 states. Uptake has been particularly widespread in this region. As you will hear over the coming two days, the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on trade have highlighted the need for resilient and robust supply chains, as well as the recognition and use of digitalized commercial documents supported by trusted data. It may therefore come as no surprise that Ancitral's most recent texts in this area, the model law on electronic transferable records, and you already saw a reference to the MLETR on the screen this morning, and the model law on the use and cross-border recognition of identity management and trust services have been welcomed by stakeholders as particularly timely and meaningful. Yet the legacy of Ancitral's earlier texts also endures as evidenced by the growing number of electronic commerce chapters of regional and plurilateral trade agreements and dedicated digital trade agreements as we've heard already from the Ministry of Justice, with which commit parties to adopting these texts as a means to establishing legal predictability in digital trade. Ancitral's work in this area continues. Working Group 4 on Electronic Commerce is meeting next month to continue to examine the frontiers of innovation and law in advancing draft legislative provisions on two topics data sharing contracts and the use of artificial intelligence and automation in contracting. These two distinct projects on interrelated topics get to the heart of the digital transformation. Those concerns echoed at the inaugural forum about fragmented legal responses to emerging technologies that helped secure consensus within the Commission for the Antitrust Secretariat to proceed with a work plan to advance preparatory work on these two topics and eventually to refer them to the working group 
once work on identity management and trust services had been finalized. If you will, one project to provide a harmonized legal rules for cross-border data sharing, succeeding another project to secure the cross-border legal recognition of trust services delivered in support for digital identity. So as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, this forum and its calls for action do not go unnoticed. I wish to take this opportunity to highlight three other developments that will be of interest to this forum. The first is the publication of Ancitral's legal taxonomy, which documents the exploratory work carried out by the Ancitral Secretariat across a range of hot topics, notably AI, data, digital assets, online platforms, and distributed ledger technology. The taxonomy analyzes each of these topics from an international commercial law perspective by A, defining the topic in legal terms, and B, identifying the actors, the legal relationships, and the legal issues involved in the deployment and the use of associated technologies and applications. I'm pleased to announce here that the English version of this publication is now available for free download as a United Nations ebook via the Ancitral website. It is my hope that this taxonomy will help demystify some of the legal dimensions of the, of the digital economy and contribute to efforts to su support digital transformation. When approving the publication of the taxonomy, the Commission acknowledged that it served not only as a living document, but also as a map to guide future work at ANSICRAL. As a case in point, the part of the technology of the, uh, uh, sorry, the, the part of the taxonomy, I'm getting mixed up, uh, dealing with distributed ledger technology spawned a proposal to prepare a guidance document on legal issues relating to the use of DLT systems in trade, which is the second development I wish to highlight. The Commission has accepted this proposal, and the Secretariat is now working with international partners to prepare a tool that offers useful explanations to businesses, especially to MSMEs and those operating in developing countries, in assessing whether DLT-enabled services address their needs. Discussions at this third installment of the ILDF, with a focus on digitalization of trade processes, will no doubt con continue the track record of this forum in shaping the work carried out by the Secretariat. And the last development that I would like to highlight this morning is a relatively new project on dispute resolution in the digital economy, which sees the Ancitral Secretariat exploring the impact of digital technologies and technology-enabled services on dispute resolution, with a view to updating, if necessary, existing norms and standards or developing new ones. In doing so, the Secretariat has embarked on an, an initiative called the world tour, in which discussions are being held in different parts of the world to ensure that perspectives from all corners are properly reflected. The preliminary findings of an initial stock taking exercise were presented to the Commission this year, and we received strong support to focus on elaborating proposals for possible legislative work on the service of electronic notices of arbitration and the recognition and enforcement of electronic arbitral awards. My colleagues at the Secretariat will be looking to see what lessons can be learned at this forum from the experience of businesses with the use of digital services in the handling of dematerialized documents. Ladies and gentlemen, focusing the discussion of this year's forum on the digitalization of trade process is all the more timely given the adoption just last month by the G20 trade and investment ministers of the high level principles 
of digitalization of trade documents and a commitment to implementing and promoting them. If the program for today's business track highlights the role of the ancestral model law on electronic transferable records, the MLETR, in legally enabling digitalization across trade finance, logistics, and paperless trade, the outcome of the G20 meeting in Jaipur underscores the enduring relevance of the guiding principles on which the model law and indeed all of UNCITRAL's work on electronic commerce are based. Functional equivalence measured by the reliability of methods used and centered on data integrity and authenticity, technology and system neutrality, respect for data privacy and protection, transparency and traceability, to name just a few. It is these guiding principles that continue to drive work at ANCITRAL in tackling new legal dimensions of the digital economy, including its project to de de develop default rules for data sharing contracts. The program for tomorrow's legal track allows the contours of that topic to be explored and examined in the context of emerging business models and international trade policy with inputs from experts at the core base. Finally, I wish to thank our co-organizers once more, the Ministry of Justice of the Republic of Korea and the Incheon Metropolitan City, and also those organizations that have lent their support to this forum, the Incheon Tourism International Organization, the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center, POSCO International, KTNet, the ICC Digital Standards Initi Initiative, and K PKU Law. Thank you for your support. Thanks to you, this forum is also exploring the new frontiers of simultaneous AI-powered interpretation. I hope that by doing so, the forum will reach an even broader audience in the region and make for an event more engaging, enriching, and productive. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. This concludes the opening session. We will now be receiving our keynote speeches. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Iman Almuteri, who will be delivering our first keynote speech. Dr. Almuteri is the Vice Minister of Commerce for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and CEO of the National Competitiveness Center. Although she could not be present with us today, she has provided a pre-recorded video. Excellencies, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here today. As much as I wanted to be with you, unfortunately, I could not make it due to work circumstances. Please allow me to talk to you a little bit today about our Vision 2030, a vision that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has embarked on in the past seven years since 2016. A vision that was led by our young leader, His Royal Highness the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman. Vision 2030 focused on weaning off the economy away from oil and gas. We wanted to diversify our economy into new sectors, sectors such as tourism, digital economy, artificial intelligence, education, healthcare, and others. We wanted to grow our non-oil revenues. We wanted to grow our renewable resources. We wanted to grow also our digital economy. Today, our trade volume in Saudi Arabia has reached $600 billion in 2022. We have also grown our e-commerce business, 33%. Total payments, transactional payments, online payments has also grown 62% this year. A woman participation in the labor market has reached 36%. We had a target to reach 30% by 2030. We have reached 36% today. We managed to actually do all these structural reforms in Saudi Arabia through working with all government entities and the private sector. One of the vision initiatives was to create the National Competitiveness Center, a center that actually has gathered all the government entities and the private sector around one table and we have achieved 700 different reforms. We have worked with international organizations so we can learn from best practices internationally. 
but we also have learned a lot from our local and international investors. We try to remove red tape as much as possible. As a result, we actually had focused on nine different focus areas to improve our competitiveness, government efficiency, services efficiencies, socioeconomic changes, business environment, laws and regulations, labor and skills, investment and access to finance, technology and innovation, transparency and accountability, healthcare and education, and of course, sustainable development. We have achieved a lot of reforms in a lot of areas related to legislations and laws. We actually have changed 1,200 laws where we either have introduced a new law, updated, merged, or even deleted some of the laws. Our court systems have been wonderful in the past seven years where we did a lot of online virtual court sessions, mediation sessions. Almost all of our court sessions are done online. We also had a lot of reforms related to technology, innovation, and logistics. Today, we can actually do custom clearance in two hours. Some of the largest companies have moved into Saudi Arabia where they have established their data center, cloud services, and others. Today, we also have 170 fintech companies established in Saudi Arabia. Our reforms have also touched on removing red tape from business environment making it easier for investors to invest in Saudi Arabia. We have looked at our licensing regime, where we have removed a lot of the licensing requirements that are either duplicated, overlapped, or not needed for lower risk reasons. 55% of the, these requirements were actually removed. We're working on removing 20% more. But not only that, we have established a one-stop shop for businesses to actually issue their license permits and do the whole journey from one place. All government entities are serving our investors from either a physical center or a digitized platform. We believe that is going to be one of a kind worldwide. It is today as easy as establishing your business in three steps in three minutes. I'm also proud to say that Saudi Arabia today is becoming a global hub for business events, sports events, and social events. We have more than 25 different global events that takes place in Saudi Arabia annually, some of which some of you might know, like the Foreign Investment Initiative Forum that takes place every year around October time. We also have the Small and Medium Enterprises event, the AI Summit, and the list goes on. So please do visit us in these forums, conferences, and events. I would also like to invite you to come and explore opportunities in our crown jewel projects like Neom, the Red Sea, Al Ula, Amala, Souda, and the list goes on. These are not only investment opportunities, but also opportunities to explore tourism in Saudi Arabia, the people of Saudi Arabia. So do please come and visit. We would love to host you. Thank you again for hosting me, and I hope you have a very good session. Thank you, Dr. al -Muteri. Next, please join me in welcoming Mr. Sachinder Singh, Deputy Secretary General for the ASEAN Economic Community at the ASEAN Secretariat to deliver our second keynote speech. His remarks will be presented through a pre-recorded video. Your Excellencies, uh, I'd like to recognize all of the dignitaries. I also like to recognize all of our panelists and distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. A very good morning and very warm greetings from the ASEAN Secretariat. I'm truly honored to be given this opportunity to address all of you, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, on the forum. In fact, over the years, I understand that the Incheon Law and Business Forum has been instrumental in bringing together representatives from law, business, and even public sectors to come together to engage in insightful discussions on various aspects of digital economy and in light of the pressing challenges that we face in accelerating of digital trade, it is especially now particularly very timely for this year's forum to be placed, you know, to be placing a very significant emphasis on a discussion to promote law reform and the business development and the support of digital trade across this region, including the ASEAN. And this is a subject that's also very close to my heart as one of the world's most dynamic and economically diverse regions, the ASEAN countries, did we recognize that harnessing the potential of digital trade 
is essentially for the need of our competitiveness in the global economy. In fact, in the last three years, since the pandemic, the region has actually witnessed a very significant surge in internet users, with an impressive addition of another 100 million users, making ASEAN today home to more than 460 million internet users. This is a remarkable increase in our digital adaptation that of course took place during the pandemic, but this is one of the unintended consequences of the pandemic, the positive one that has played a vital role in really propelling our region, propelling the ASEAN digital economy, which has reached almost a milestone of a US $200 billion in value in 2022. And the size of the digital economy is projected to be further growing and exponentially is going to grow to a size of about a trillion US dollars by 2030. Now, with the recent launch of the negotiations of the ASEAN Digital Economy Framework Agreement, now this is the name of the agreement, in short, we call it DEFA, just like a trade agreement of any kind, this is another economic agreement that's going to be moving towards integrating the digital economy of ASEAN. This groundbreaking agreement, DEFA, is really the world's first major regional-wide digital economic agreement that's anticipating to sort of almost double the contribution of the size of our digital economy. From what I said, 20, uh, 2030 target of 1 trillion, it could possibly jump to 2 trillion US dollars. And if we can actually negotiate a comprehensive, meaningful, impactful agreement. This is really a momentous development as it not only solidifies the ASEAN dynamism, but also enhances our competitive edge on a global economic landscape. Digital trade, as you know, is a critical component, central component of DEFA negotiations. And underlying ASEAN's commitment is to further explore the utilization of digital technology as a catalyst for our economic transformation. Ladies and gentlemen, Despite our, the enormous potential, digital trade in ASEAN still confronts several critical challenges. Of course, we cannot ignore that there are varying levels of digital infrastructure readiness in the region, along with the fact that there are inconsistent data privacy regulations. All these pose obstacles even to seamless flow of digital transactions across borders. Moreover, we also understand that there are pressing concerns relating to cybersecurity standards, as well as there's a need and necessity for us to establish a much more robust consumer protection and dispute resolution mechanisms that are needed to manage the whole aura of digital trade. Now, with all of these challenges in mind, I would also like to share some of the following thoughts and also I would like to make some proposals for the considerations for the forum. I think first, in ASEAN, I think we need to accelerate the process of streamlining and harmonizing our digital trade regulations across our ASEAN member states in accordance with the laws of international trade. In fact, recent findings from the OECD Digital Services Trade Restrictiveness Index, it's called Digital STRI, it highlights a very concerning trend of regulatory fragmentation in Asia Pacific, not just in ASEAN, but in the whole of Asia Pacific, which again continues to hinder digital trade. Now, many countries in the region still maintain policies that kind of impede access to communications infrastructure and the free flow movement of information across networks, including cross-border transfer of data. Now, establishing a unified regulatory framework is therefore very imperative to provide legal certainty, as well as to be able to instill confidence to develop capacity building programs, all aiming to utilizing and implementing the Unistral model laws, especially on the Unistral model law on electronic transferable records. In short, we call it the MLETR, right? Within ASEAN. Uh, collaborating with partners, including collaborating with UN agencies and international development agencies, we really need to come together to raise this awareness and really be taking no more time. I think there's very little time left. We really need to move fast in the adoption of the Unistral text, which is very crucial. I understand that in most of the developed world, this is moving at a very high speed rate. 
and we don't want to be left behind in ASEAN. Uh, second, it is also crucial, extremely crucial that we continue to develop and we adhere to digital trade standards to promote transparency, to promote efficiency and to promote security in the global digital economy. Now, this includes the standardization of some of our data privacy laws and also standardization of e-invoicing. I would even say things like e-commerce regulations, all of which to ensure that we can maintain consistency, we can reduce barriers to cross-border digital transactions. Now, who's going to benefit? It's really all stakeholders are going to benefit. This is going to bring costs down from all of us and going to make us extremely competitive globally. Now, in order for us to move in that direction, we need to develop a set of coherent standards across ASEAN. And therefore, the Digital Trade Standards and Conformance Working Group, which was established in the March of 2020, is been set up to deliberate on the adoption of these standards that promote interoperability. We are not talking about harmonization, but we are hoping we can at least achieve interoperability, not only within ASEAN, but also be able to connect with the other parts of the world. Now, considering this broad spectrum of areas in digital trade, this working group in ASEAN has already commenced the work program with a primary focus on facilitating digital transactions, digital logistics, as well as cybersecurity. Now, in this regard, in ASEAN, we welcome this collaboration with Unistral and all other international partners in order to extend capacity building programs to ASEAN and even explore the possibility of technical assistance to integrate international standards in national legislation and even in individual ASEAN member states. I think there is a lot of assistance needed and this is where it's not just the UN agencies but multilaterals like ADB in our region can really be able to be our very strong partners. Lastly, I also want to highlight that it remains critical that we continue to address digital infrastructure connectivity gaps which need to be addressed in order to facilitate digital trade and further reduce transaction costs. And hopefully we can provide for our people, for our community, a platform, including for small, medium-sized micro firms to be able to thrive and to be able to reach global markets. An equally important factor in this area is the need to strengthen our human institutional capacities in order for in order to ensure that we are able to bring our communities our workers to participate meaningfully in the digital economy and under the framework of the ASEAN digital master plan 2025 ASEAN has established a vision to improve our ICT connectivity and services in order to make them affordable accessible especially in rural areas and also to help develop measures to enhance the resilience of ICT infrastructure. This is extremely important. I think we need to make sure that infrastructure is accessible and affordable. Otherwise, we are not going to achieve our digital uh, economic growth that we are talking about. The private sector at the same time needs to also stand with, along with, our, with the public sector. You play a very important role, a major role in co-investing in some of these areas and therefore I would like to encourage our businesses in the ASEAN including global investors to come together with us work with our regulators on the ground to promote this equality this quality this accessibility this affordability of digital connectivity and services for our community ladies and gentlemen just wish to reiterate finally that harmonizing regulations fostering digital trade standards as well as addressing digital connectivity gaps, undoubtedly these are the instrumental foundations in order to enable inclusive and sustainable digital trade. There are challenges remaining in formulating some of the coherent regional policies that will strike a delicate balance between safeguarding privacy, upholding region national security, as well as promoting transparency and also fostering what we are looking for in this region, economic growth and relevance. However, I am confident that the discussions and the collaborations that are taking place in this forum will pave the way and will give some new ideas towards greater ability for us to integrate more effectively for an inclusive, sustainable digital trade. 
With that, let me wish all of you a successful and a productive discussions for the whole day. Thank you, Mr. Singh. As announced, we will now like to invite the opening speakers to take a photo. I respectfully request our Eastern opening speakers to approach the stage. Yeah, let me give a cue. One, two, three. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, we will now be taking the group photo with all on site attendees. We would be very grateful if all our attendees could please join us with the speakers at the front. Please come forward and stand on the stage and on the stairs. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now have a short break and resume with our first panel at 11 o'clock. During the break, a slide that featuring the events program, as well as information on the ONSI trial e-learning modules and newly published taxonomy of legal issues related to the digital economy will be shown. Please feel free to have a look. During this time, we would like to request the virtual speakers of the upcoming panel to stay online so that we can test your connections. Thank you. For participants who have just joined us, welcome to the third Incheon Law and Business Forum. Kindly note that we are currently on a short break and the next session will begin at 11 o'clock Korea Standard Time. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our first panel for this morning, the Business Track 1 panel themed MLETR Implementation in Paperless Trade. It is my pleasure to welcome Mr. Luca Castellani as the moderator for this session. Luca is a legal officer in the Secretariat of Ancitral in Vienna, Austria. As Secretary of Working Group 4, he oversaw the preparation of the Ancitral Model Law on Electronic Transferable Records and of the Ancitral Model Law on the Use in Cross-Border Recognition of Identity Management and Trust Services and has assisted several countries in the enactment of Ancitral texts on electronic commerce. Luca is also actively involved in the field of CIS law, where he promotes 
participation in the UN Convention on Contracts for International Sale of Goods and has coordinated the preparation of the UNSEED trial HGCH Unidraw Legal Guide to Uniform Instruments in the area of international commercial contracts with a focus on sales. Thank you for joining us today, Luca. I now the pass the floor to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Hangyeol. Um, good morning to everyone. I would say at this point in time, it's either a good morning or a, a early good morning uh, for our friends uh, who are in West Asia and possibly um, those who wake up really early in Europe. Um, it's, it's really a great pleasure for me to be here. I would like, there, there were already many thanks, of course, I joined with uh, both of thanks to all the organizers, co-organizers and sponsors. In particular, I would like to thank um, my colleagues from the Regional Center for Asia and the Pacific, who are the ones who really put the hard work, but especially uh, our speakers and our in-person participants and online participants. You know uh, how uh, it works with attendance on these hybrid events. Um, I'm happy to say that we already passed the mark of uh, 1,000 participants with the online component when we put together uh, the two streaming channels, because I, as it was mentioned before, uh, this event is also being uh, streamed live with captions in the Chinese language uh, generated by uh, artificial intelligence, uh, thanks to our uh, partners in PKU Law. Uh, we have uh, four uh, panelists in this first panel. Um, the topic of the panel is the implementation uh, of the model on electronic transfer records and, of course, other relevant developments in trade finance and fintech. Uh, we have a website with a detailed uh, biography of each uh, speaker. I would refer you to that. And I would like now to move with our first speaker. First speaker is uh, a dear friend, Mr. Stephen Beck. He is the head of the Trade and Supply Chain Finance Program at the Asian Development Bank. And I would like to stress already this program of the Asian Development Bank has been uh, particularly active in promoting the adoption of the MLETR. Uh, we have had uh, events already this year in two countries, in Georgia and, and in the People's Republic of China. Uh, there will be other countries joining uh, uh, in the coming years. The ADB welcomes the interest of its member states uh, towards receiving this type of technical assistance. Uh, which is usually delivered in partnership with Ancitral and with other partners, including our friends from the uh, International Chamber of Commerce Digital Standards Initiative. So as these, these two days are two days on uh, digitization of trade documents, transitions from documents to trade, but in particular, business solutions and legal solutions and support to be able to take advantage of those solutions. So I would like to flag that. Stephen, um, as, a, as a concurring uh, engagement, he sent us a pre-recorded video. So I would ask my colleagues to play his video. Thank you. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, many thanks to Melita for this, uh, to Ancitral for this opportunity to uh, talk about Melita, which uh, Asian Development Bank sees as an extremely important uh, uh, opportunity uh, for transformation and uh, 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 in trade, and as a result, uh, uh, very exciting possibilities uh, for uh, for development uh, through uh, the digitalization of trade. But before I, I go there, I'd just like to remind um, participants what Asian Development Bank is. It's a multilateral development bank, AAA rated, owned by 68 different shareholder governments. Um, uh, G7, including, of course, PRC and, uh, and India and uh, Indonesia, Australia, um, uh, with a mandate to essentially improve people's lives uh, to uh, support development in, uh, in Asia. And ADB does that through uh, guarantees, loans, 
uh, equity investments, um, policy advice, capacity building, and technical assistance. Um, uh, the bank was established in 1966. Um, and since 1966, we've seen the impact of trade and its ability to lift millions of people out of poverty. And so trade has got to be a very important part of you know, how we think about development. And at Asian Development Bank, we have uh, a trade and supply chain finance uh, program, which uh, does operations. It provides guarantees and loans uh, to support uh, trade and supply chains. And some of the more challenging uh, markets where the private sector has uh, difficulty uh, operating. So we partner with the private sector to, uh, to support trade and supply chains and the, and the, the, the growth and the job creation uh, uh, and the development that comes from uh, trade and supply chains. And in addition to the guarantees and loans, we have a number of special sort of initiatives and, and projects to address what could be regarded as maybe some of the weaknesses in uh, trade. So, uh, for example, we we try to make uh, trade more inclusive, uh, uh, more transparent, uh, more uh, resilient. Certainly, out of uh, out of COVID, we saw a need to make global trade and supply chains more uh, more resilient. Um, and uh, we also uh, are uh, actively engaged in an effort uh, with the global community to make global trade and supply chains more green. Um, and so. Uh, what we've observed um, uh, across the board in our efforts to provide financing to more challenging markets or make trade more inclusive, green, transparent, et cetera, is that the digitalization of trade um, is uh, a key element that really underpins our ability to make substantial gains in arguably all of these areas. And so uh, what ANSA trial has done um, in creating Melita uh, has provided the world with an incredible uh, opportunity to transform uh, uh, trade, to take what is now really an antiquated, uh, uh, inefficient uh, uh, process, albeit one that has served us very well for hundreds of years and, and, and as I mentioned uh, earlier, has delivered millions of people out of poverty, but we're at, a, at an apex now where we have a tremendous opportunity uh, to uh, drive a global productivity through the roof, uh, to uh, generate uh, significantly more uh, uh, global growth uh, through the digitalization of trade and achieve a lot of these objectives that I mentioned earlier around transparency and 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 uh, and so on. So uh, the opportunities are very exciting around digitalization of trade, but we're not going to be able to get there unless we do two things. Um, on the one hand, we need to agree um, on the electronic forms of uh, paper documents uh, that are currently used in trade. So in other words, we need to transform in the sense that uh, we need to, to replace paper with, with data and, and the, the development impact that that would have uh, could be substantially. Um, so we need to agree on the electronic forms, um, number one. And number two, we need, of course, legislation in, in, in all you know, major countries around the world uh, uh, to recognize those electronic documents for trade. Um, so those are the two things we need to do. In a sense, it's it's easy. Of course, implementing that is is challenging. So the Asian Development Bank, um, in conjunction with the government of Singapore and uh, the International Chamber of Commerce, created the Digital Standards Initiative to tackle both of these uh, objectives. And so the work on the the digital documents, uh, electronic documents for trade, is continuing. Um, and and to get that done. Uh, the Digital Standards Initiative is bringing together, has brought together each sort of component part of the trade ecosystem to work on transforming from paper to uh, electronic versions some 35 documents that are used in trade. And so uh, exporting uh, community has been brought together, shipping with ports, with customs, with logistics and warehousing, uh, finance, um, uh, tech and importers to agree on what those electronic uh, documents 
are going to be. And then with respect to the, uh, uh, the, the, the legislative piece, um, uh, the, under the Digital Standards Initiative, uh, there's been a, a, a legal reform board that's been created, which ADP is also involved with, and, and we've got the other multilateral de development banks involved uh, as well in the legal reform board, which is really focused on uh, 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 ensuring that governments uh, align their legal frameworks to uh, uh, the principles of Meliter uh, so that we can have uh, uh, the, the legislation uh, in place around the world that recognizes those electronic documents that are coming uh, into, uh, into play. So this is an extremely exciting undertaking uh, uh, and we've been very happy to partner with, with UNCITRAL. Um, my colleague Nigel, uh, later on in the afternoon, he's on a, on a panel, he's going to talk about some of the specific things we've been doing in, uh, in PRC in Georgia and some other jurisdictions around capacity building uh, and information uh, to try to try to move uh, uh, some of these countries uh, forward uh, on that objective on the legal reform uh, side of this initiative to, to digitalize global trade. We've been working uh, very actively at the G20 level uh, uh, and now uh, we're kicking off an initiative uh, uh, to work with uh, at least through APEC to achieve our objectives uh, on the legal reform side of this uh, initiative to uh, digitalize global trade. So um, uh, uh, we're very excited about the possibilities. Uh, digitalizing global trade uh, truly would be transformative on a, on a historic uh, level for so many reasons. Um, it needs to get done. Uh, we very much appreciate uh, that this group is being brought together uh, to discuss how to move this forward. And I'd just like to, to emphasize the importance of collaboration. And certainly in a general sense, I think we all know that that's, you know, that's going to be required to, to actually get this done. But beyond just the sort of general idea of all of us sort of talking about this and, and, and collaborating in a, in a sort of high level, we need a plan. We need a very specific uh, plan that's that's organized through, I would argue, the Digital Standards Initiative because it has all of the uh, uh, the, the right uh, uh, institutions uh, participating in this legal reform board under the Digital Standards Initiative uh, to 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 have a plan to coordinate um, and to uh, actually drive forward in a very sort of deliberate, determined way with milestones. Um, and timeframes and so on uh, uh, on exactly, you know, how is it that we're going to convince these major governments that have yet to align their domestic legislations with the principles of, uh, of Malitra, how are we going to cross that finish line? And so um, uh, if I could uh, uh, make an appeal, ADB is, uh, uh, you know, we're at the table. We're very happy to participate in any way that we can to developing this plan and executing this plan. And um, I would ask that, you know, at this gathering, we discuss not just in sort of in terms of high level sort of uh, uh, terms, you know, how important this objective is, but exactly how are we going to cross the finish line uh, to, to get the, 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 the countries that we need to, to have this uh, sort of alignment of legislation in place, how are we going to cross that finish line? And so uh, with that, I'd like to, to close my comments. I'd like to thank uh, UNCITRAL again very much uh, uh, for you know, all the collaboration, all the work uh, that we're doing together. Um, we're very excited about uh, continuing to move this agenda forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, I'm sure that uh, your call for interest in working with you and with others uh, will not be unheeded. You will get a lot of feedback. Uh, we will miss you here, uh, but I'm sure that uh, you will hear from many of us soon. Now we get to the uh, real business, real business. 
we have uh, with us Mr. Fatarafon Ratana Suvan. Please call me Mac, he said. Now, um, um, he is the senior vice president in trade services of the Bangkok Bank in Thailand. Now, uh, why did we ask him and we thank him very much for coming? Because Thailand is uh, really a bit of a pioneer here, especially the private sector. The Association of the Banks of Thailand uh, has made a strong call for the adoption of MLTR. Stephen called MLTR Melita. You can choose if you want to be close to, to this model. Though. You can call Melita, it's a very sweet name. Uh, 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 or if you want to be a bit more formal, you can call it MLETR. Um, but uh, but the, 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 the Thai banks have made this strong call, and we really want to know why they made this call and what's behind that. Thank you. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I clearly look after the trade uh, product management at Bangkok Bank, and uh, today I have a privilege of representing Thai Banker Association uh, to provide you some update on uh, Thailand digital trade uh, transformation. So when you talk about trade, uh, we can categorize in probably in two areas. One is domestic and one is international. Uh, in Thailand itself, uh, you might have observed that there is so many uh, multiple uh, fragmented ecosystem which I think this ecosystem is aimed to provide the, uh, the process efficiency to the, uh, the, the clients. And oftentimes this ecosystem has been created by banks or RAC corporate um, and try to provide the, uh, the efficiency as well as the financing to their supply chains. However, this, this model has been uh, present in the Thailand for the past uh, 15 or 20 years. And, but the expansion of this um, uh, ecosystem has been very really limited uh, with a number of reasons. Uh, first is on the resource of the bank and the corporate itself try to get together and build ecosystem. And also the time and the money that has spent in creating an uh, ecosystem. And therefore the benefits of the processing efficiency and financing is only uh, limited to the specific group of the supply chains. If you talk about the second tier, third tier, then the, the access to financing is, is rather limited. To address this issue, um, Bank of Thailand has launched an initiative as part of their uh, smart financial and payment infrastructure for business project to create a common platform to facilitate domestic trades. Um, if you can see on the left uh, box on the, uh, on the left side, this common platform can uh, facilitate exchanging of the, uh, the purchase order invoice payments as well as the tax receive to the platform this platform has been known as a uh, promise um, there is two uh, separate track that working on this platform one is uh, uh, working on the trade and payments earlier try to establish a, a solid foundation um, for trade processes as well as the connectivity to the domestic payment rail while the other concentrate on the supply chain financing, uh, offering a financing bet on the transaction debit process to the promise itself. With this platform, um, we hope that we can bring the, uh, the, the process efficiency uh, deeper into the uh, just supply chain tier. And with this uh, concept, uh, you can uh, typically we use file like a cost loop financing type of the financing stuff. With this platform, uh, we can find that one buyer can use one bank for of payments and can have another bank to do the financing to the supply chain to this platform. Uh, and with this in common infrastructure, I think we can bring uh, ecosystem uh, more faster than, and than ever. Um, the working group in this uh, 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 team has been include both uh, buyer uh, Thai banks uh, as well as Thai Bank uh, Association and also the uh, national item egg who is the, uh, the the key entity who responsible for building the uh, thailand uh, payment infrastructure um, the platform has been uh, technically live uh, early this year uh, many banks is on the preparation process of getting the uh, internal process documentation and stuff like that for the commercializations uh, in fact uh, few bank has publicly announced uh, last month that they are ready on production uh, for this platform. So that's probably the, uh, 
the, the wrap up of our current effort on the domestic trade. So now let's look at the international trade. Um, similar to domestic trade, we have a multiple platform in, within the country and outside the country. Um, we probably have the common uh, infrastructure on the, uh, the custom, which is under national single window, which is driven by the government sector, try to enhance efficiency in the government to government and business to government interactions. Why the uh, NSW has been making progress in terms of connecting uh, the, the counterparty internally and uh, connecting with the custom with other countries, there's a big uh, room for improvement in the business to business sector. And that's yeah. why we have created this project, uh, namely NDTP or National Digital Trade Platform. It has been co-created by uh, two uh, key organizations. Uh, one is uh, JSCCIB, uh, Joint Standing uh, Commission, a Committee on uh, Commercial Industry and Banking, which is, consists of three uh, key bodies. Uh, one is a trade, a Thai Chamber of Commerce. Uh, second is a Federation of Thai Industry. And third is the uh, Thai Banker Association. And together with the uh, uh, a body from the government, which is uh, OPDC, the Office of Public Sector Development uh, Commissions. Uh, we have joined force to create this uh, 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 project, which is aimed to you know, be a common platform for business to connect uh, Thailand uh, internally and internationally uh, to other platforms with the, uh, the country, particularly in the Asia uh, regions. Uh, to this, uh, both, to, both project, we hope that we will uh, try to solve the, uh, the, the current uh, problem on two areas, which is on the, uh, the efficiency of the trade transaction, as well as the uh, inclusive of the financing. So let's uh, have a closer look on the NDP, which uh, we have a pilot uh, phase one last year. The focus is on the open account transaction for both importer and exporter, uh, covering the e-document like a purchase order, invoice, and packing list, while the, uh, the transportation document like bill blending, we still uh, handle, handle through the, uh, the PDF. Uh, as you know that uh, bill blending or the logistics have their own uh, ecosystem, so we try to deal with a separate uh, track. And I think at that time, we are quite fortunate that uh, we have a privilege of collaborating with uh, Singapore and Japan who already have a similar platform working in that country. So uh, we were working with Japan and Singapore on uh, pilot this uh, project last year by connecting our platform with the uh, NTP platform from Singapore and, and Trade Wall in, in Japan. And also we have a colleague from uh, Trade Wall today as well uh, in this conference. Um, we have fly uh, a, a successful uh, live uh, POC in November last year. And in this POC, we have uh, learned a lot in terms of a uh, thing that we need to build, uh, proper build the connectivity with other trade ecosystem. A uh, few more things that we come up uh, while we uh, sort of uh, retro looking back on what we have done in the POC is one is on the, uh, the standard that each country need to adopt a similar standard. Even we talk about the same document, when we actually do a transaction, there's so uh, other element that you have to consider in terms of getting connect, it's just one of the documents. And also the legal, the legal framework um, to so, so that enable the two platform to be able to connect uh, legally. And also, this, uh, also the identity identification uh, aspect of the, 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 the platform tied to connect so that they know how uh, which party is on the platform when they talk across the, the party. And we also learn a lot from the, uh, the participant, uh, importer and exporter who provide the feedback in terms of what else that we need to be uh, uh, do to get uh, more adoption to the platform like this. So that's sort of thing that we have done uh, last year. Now let's have a look into the, uh, the banking community. Uh, as a subsequent uh, from the POC of uh, NDP last year, uh, Thai Banker Association has discussed and think that we probably need a common platform for the bank itself to connect to the NDP as well as to other system. And that's why we create another project uh, called PlumTate. Uh, the PlumTate is uh, aims uh, to drive the international trade digitization, uh, especially for the bank related uh, function 
and uh, features, which I think we are uh, rely on three pillars. One is on the uh, the leveraging on the NTPT uh, phase one that we have done. The second is on the documentary, uh, sorry, uh, trade document registry, the existing system that bank have been using within the banking community. And the third one is potential uh, uh, connectivity or synergy with the domestic trade platform, which is the, the problem based. On the uh, trade document registry, just give you some background, uh, or we call it TDR. Uh, this system has been co-created by uh, initial six Thai banks. They come together that try to find a, a system that help to prevent the double financing in a trade financing transaction. So we come up with the requirements, the business rule, the way to uh, move a thing forward on this. And then we ask the uh, national ITMX to build platform for us. Uh, the platform has been live uh, since February 2021. And currently we have X bank on the platform and we uh, probably get another four bank within this year to join the platform, which I think we probably have uh, up to or more than 80% of the trade finance uh, in the Thailand market join the platform so that we can prevent the double financing and be comfortable to provide more financing to the communities. Um, this uh, platform also, uh, or be part of the uh, NTP uh, phase uh, one uh, scope as well. We try to prove that uh, the NTP can uh, authenticate the trade document that happening in the NTP platform so that bank have a visibility of the document and underwriting transaction for financing. So I think that leveraging on the TDR and the NTP, I think we can enhance the prompt here to be able to facilitate uh, a Thai importer exporter to connect with a uh, counterparty in various countries in, uh, in a more efficient way. And also the visibility on the document uh, that we have seen, then we should be, uh, the bank should be more comfortable to provide the financing uh, to the, uh, the, the, the Thai importer and exporter, uh, particularly on the SME uh, business and also the potential to connect with the uh, uh, domestic trade uh, problem which hopefully in one day we could have like a one single uh, portal for our Thai company to do both uh, domestic and uh, trade uh, transactions. So that's probably, probably the conclude the update of uh, what's happening in Thailand in terms of uh, uh, trade digitization transformation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think that um, you already uh, identified one of the main features of our discussions, that is to say the creation of these ecosystems, open ecosystems where uh, trade transactions can take place and different participants uh, are able to, to exchange information. Our uh, next speaker actually is uh, joining us from afar. And I thank her because she's one of those to whom my uh, good morning to early risers was, was addressed. Mrs. Shafak al Kuheji, she's the head of payment services at the Benefit Company uh, in, in Bahrain. She's joining us from Manama, Bahrain. And the reason why we asked her, and we are very grateful to her for joining us, is Bahrain was. Uh, Good morning, Shafak. How are you? Good morning. We're happy to see you. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Thank you. No, thank you for the very early rise. Uh, I, I was saying we are extremely grateful for your participation because Bahrain was the first country in the, in the world to adopt the MLETR, but you are also one of the very first uh, um, companies that provide a service that leverages on the fact that MLETR is in force. And in particular, uh, this is an electronic check service uh, that uh, is provided by the Benefit Company. The Benefit is a consortium of banks of, uh, in Bahrain. And, and I would say, I, I don't want, of course, to spoil anything of what you're gonna say, but I was at a conference in Vienna, Austria, a few months ago, and we were discussing MLETR and this was a conference of bankers. And then your Bahraini colleagues could raise their hand and say, actually, you know what, we have the app on our phone and we can show you how it works and it's already there. So thank you, Shafak. The floor is. 
Thank you everyone for um, inviting me. It's a pleasure being with you. I, I wish I was able to be physically there with you, but I think maybe next times, there will be next times and maybe that next times we'll be able to, let's to, to participate physically. Now, just a quick update about the benefit company as rightly mentioned by you, we are a consortium of banks, but we are considered to be the payment infrastructure um, of the benefit company. And by being the payment infrastructure, what I am trying to say is that we are having infrastructure services such as instant payment systems. We operate this switch, the debit card for ATM point of sale and payment gateway. We are also as well having the credit reference payroll, EKYC gateway and the e-check operator and trust service operator. So in Bahrain journey, I'm not sure if the presentation will be shared, but if not, then I'm more than happy to go without the presentation. I've got everything on top of my head, so I can go other ways. But in general, Bahrain has started its, its journey by first of all, establishing two important laws and two important uh, legislations. And those are royal decrees issued by His Majesty the King um, of Bahrain, where the two important legislations, so if we could go, I think, to, if we could skip the slide, and let's skip all of this, because I've done the intro, and we could skip this because I've got, yeah, here, perfect. So we've got law number 524, which is the electronic communication and transaction law. And this law governs the digital signature and the, we call it in Bahrain secured electronic signature. We are basing our law on the ETI uh, qualified signature standards and the EDA standard, but we have our own version of it. And then the TRA, which is the Telecom Regulation Authority, is a regulatory body that governs digital signatures or trust service providers in the country and licenses them and accredits them to operate in Bahrain. And the benefit company is the first TSP operator in Bahrain with the first accredited TSP provider within our kingdom. Law number 55 is a very important law as well, which kind of allows and enables the company or the banking industry in general to digitalize electron, digital or paper-based transferable records. And the first implementation of electronic transferable records was electronic check itself. And the main reason why the country and the Central Bank of Bahrain has emphasized on changing, if I may say, or digitalizing the check itself as a, as a first use case is the fact that within our supply chain, within our internal SME trading, checks are heavily reliable among suppliers and buyers. And the main reason of the, our market being heavily dependent on checks are two important characteristics of checks. The first characteristic is that within our current legislations, a bounce check is considered to be a criminal offense. And if I have a bounce check and then, let's say, for example, I'm a supplier, I've shipped you X amount of, let's say, uh, raw material, and then you don't pay me back, then I could go and raise a criminal offense directly at the public prosecution or at the police stations, depending on the value of the check. And then you will be banned from traveling and immediate action will be taken against you. On top of that, which is a very important characteristic, is that the check by itself, it's a promissory note of payment. So it's an indebtedness note. So a lot of, within the SME market, the cash flow management and having sufficient cash to pay in, in advance is quite an issue for SMEs, especially since within the supply chain within our country, a lot of the trade depends on sales on credit among supplier and buyer. So therefore, check is a convenience method where I'm able to pay to my supplier without me having necessarily having the sufficient cash today. So that a lot of our checks are post-dated checks and not immediately paid checks. And obviously, to have an electronic transfer record as a check being recognized in the country, Central Bank of Bahrain had to issue resolution number 21 of electronic checks. If you can go to the next slide as well. Thank you. So... Those resolutions were the high level and legislations were the high level, let's see, underlying um, legislation that the, the country had to, to put in place. But there were sub requirements that were published by the TRA and the Central Bank of Bahrain. TRA being the regulator of the trust service provider, Central Bank of Bahrain being the regulator of electronic check as electronic transferable record. And those re the detailed resolutions or directives and regulations detail the standards, the requirements, the operating requirements on the operator of this, those two systems. And with this case, it's both benefit company, we are the trust service provider, and we are the electronic transferable record system as well. If you could move to, go to the next slide, please. So now what's very important aspect of the physical 
One of the challenges we face as a country when we were converting a physical document into electronic is that as per the Czechs, let's say law today under Ministry of Industrial and Commerce law, is the fact that a check, um, a, dig- a paper check is tangible. So whoever possesses the physical check is has the control over the check and is the bearer of the check and has the right to claim the value of the check. When we move it to become a, um, an electronic check, that, that, that concept of control is a bit different. If we could go to the next slide, please. So why did we go to electronic check to start with? Obviously, we, had, we, went, we are through a digital transformation in our banking industry, all in all. We were successful at digitalizing cash-based transactions where we converted the most neglected, smallest micropayments into digital. And then, but what we noticed is that the main services we are providing are consumer to business. But within the B2B, we're still lacking digitalization. And that's where the first initiative is the issuance or the provide, providing the electronic check for that um, SME market within the B2B community. Obviously, checks, e-checks are safer, they're, more, they're controllable, and they're easy and convenient. Next, please. So the life cycle of the check, and that is what the electronic record management system does. It measures, it handles the data and the metadata associated with the electronic check from the moment it's created until the end of its life cycle, from the registration to the authorized signatory activation, who are the people authorized to sign the check, and they have the control over the check. So the e-check book, the e-check issuance, writing, sharing the check with the beneficiary or the payee, depositing the check, and then clearing and settling, and then finally, the archiving aspect. I'll try to be very quick over here by explaining the control aspect of the check, which is a very important legal requirement on the operator of the e-check today. So at the registration, there is no electronic check being created. I'm just registering myself as a current account opener and registering my colleague, for example, let's say, Latifa as a beneficiary or payee of the check. Both are registered, so both are recognized within the electronic check system. The authorized signatory, who is whoever, the drawer, who has authority to sign and write and issue the check. Once you request a digital serial of checks from and to, then what happens is that the control of the check becomes at the hand of the drawer. Once the drawer signs the check and the check is properly signed and completely so we could have multiple authorized signatories, the control moves to the payee of the check. And once the check is expired or the check has been deposited successfully or the check has been canceled by the payee, then the control moves to the central system of the e-check. So the, having and demonstrating and make sure we have proper controls of controlling the electronic record was extremely vital. Next, please. So a very quick overview from a registration perspective, we enabled our national wallet, Benefit Pay, which our, my colleague was mentioning, or sorry, our, um, our moderator here was mentioning that we have a national app in the country we're allowing payments. We extend the same app to enable retail to issue and receive checks. But we also have a dedicated specialized mobile app and portal for the corporate clients because they've got multiple authority matrix and different processes of checker and maker. People who are administrating the checks are different than those who are authorizing and signing the checks. Next, please. So the very, second important service that we have offered in Bahrain is a trust service provider where due to our digital signatures. And the country Bahrain are basing their standards on the Etsy standards of qualified signature and the EDAS standards. So in a nutshell, I'm, I'm sure the audience understand what a private key is or what a signature is. So it's a, it's a pair of a private and public key, which is used to hash and sign any electronic document. And we do sign the electronic check and we hash the content of the electronic check PDF version using the TSP services. It allows us to authenticate and to verify that this check has been signed and controlled and the full control of that check is with the drawer of the check at the moment of signing. Next, please. So from a journey, obviously, we had to go through a very intense journey. We're happy to partner with EY, which was a major um, advisor to us in the implementation of TSP service in Bahrain. And we have also used the services of Certi Trust, who are our enabler or provider of TSP services. They are, they are the provider of our signing component and the route say it through their partners as well. 
So we started the journey since 2018 by issuing the Dorian decrees and enabling the markets. And then came our time where we had to go onto the actual implementation. We were certified accredited by the TRA in July, 2021. And then obviously we went live by October, 2021. Next please. So in Bahrain, we have, there are multiple kinds of digital signatures from, from, from for time purpose. If I'm running out of time, please do notify me. So I try to wrap up quickly. So from a secure electronic signature, I'm gonna focus mainly on the secure electronic signature because in Bahrain, our laws recognizes the secure electronic signature as a non-disputable, non-reputable um, signature in the, in the courts of law. Other signatures are being recognized. I mean, DocuSign or any other um, similar service providers can provide such services to, to stakeholders in Bahrain. The difference is that the burden of proof relies with the with the party that is depending on the signature. But when it comes to our digital signatures, the burden of proof relies with the party, let's say, if I may say, raising a claim against our digital signatures. So obviously from a electronic signature, it cannot be signed. It can't be changed after signing from integrity perspective. The, we are able to 100% identify the person because we use in the registration process equivalent to face-to-face -face, um, um, either IDMV services or face-to-face -face registration, KYC processing, or else you're not onboarded onto the, onto, onto the digital services. It is authentic where we can guarantee and link the signature with the drawer directly or the, or the owner of the certificate. And we are having proper controls to assure that the, the signature creation device in, in, it's an entire process and flu are under very strong authentication and security controls. And obviously from a legal perspective, given we were certified, we are irrefutable and we are with the burden of proof relies with the signing party. Next, please. So what makes an electronic signature secure? First of all, it's the qualified signature creation device that we are guaranteeing as per the international standards. Within the laws, it's equivalent to the wet ink signature. It uniquely identifies and links the signatory with the signature itself. It's unreputable, it's immutable, it has the sole control with the signatory, and it is certified by our local regulators within our country. Next, please. So what are the use case of digital signatures? And how could that digital signature enable other electronic transfer records to be enabled? Well, usually, our market today are looking at about three major banks who are looking at using digital signatures for consumer lending, account opening, or any high, high risk or high financial value transaction. With high risk and high financial tra value transaction, when you use digital certified signatures by the country, you are protecting yourself from any legal, uh, legal uh, let's say, risk. By that, I think I can conclude, unless I've got more time, and I could answer any questions, or if there are no questions, I'm under your command. Thank you very much, Shafak. This was uh, very loud and clear. Uh, we had, before you spoke, we, we were asking, how do we do electronic checks? Now we know. <laughs> I wish you could see uh, the, the attention of our participants here in the room. Uh, I am pretty sure that uh, those online had a, a similar level of attention. Uh, we have requests uh, to, to uh, put the slides online. I hope that all the speakers uh, will give their, their uh, agreement to this and we will be able, but also the, this, this event is recorded and will be available on demand um, in the future. So thank you, Shafak. Don't leave us thank just you for yet in me. case there are questions, stay online. Sure, sure, I will. And now we have, um, as the, the last speaker uh, of our panel, and a, you know, a special treat, Lucy Wong, advisor, Bank for International Settlements, Innovation Hub in Hong Kong, China. Uh, I want to congratulate Lucy. We have read yesterday the final statement of the G20, and there was a specific reference to a paper of BIS Innovation Hub on CBDC. I'm pretty sure your hand was there. <laughs> so now 
we have her with Project Dynamo. Project Dynamo is about um, uh, trade finance, is about uh, closing the finance gap, and is about a word that is very popular these days, tokenization of electronic documents. Can you tokenize a commercial document with Melita? Of course you can. But now Lucy is going to give us some insight of the specific issues of tokenization. Thank you, Lucy. The floor is yours. Thank you, Luca. Uh, can you hear me all right? No? Right. Right. Is this better? Yes. Is this better? Right. Hi. My name is Lucy, and uh, I'm an advisor at the BIS Innovation Hub Hong Kong Center. So for those of you who are less familiar uh, with BIS Innovation Hub, uh, we were set up by the BIS four years ago. And you all know BIS has a long standing history, but the Innovation Hub is relatively new. And the reason that the BIS set up Innovation Hub is to uh, serve our central banks. As you know, central banks are our shareholders and as also as our customers. So uh, the purpose of the hub is to um, conduct in-depth uh, studies into the latest technology development and, and also uh, produce knowledge as public good uh, for our central bank audience. So we have uh, centers all around the world uh, in Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, Basel, uh, Toronto, and also Paris uh, recently, uh, Frankfurt actually <laughs> recently. And um, so I myself is uh, based in Hong Kong Center. So we, um, in June, three months ago, we delivered uh, a, a report uh, on our project Dynamo, uh, which was uh, run for uh, 12 months. And as Luca mentioned, it's a project uh, about using stablecoin and digital token for SME finance uh, in the supply chain setting. So I'm sure you are all very familiar uh, with the challenges, uh, substantial challenges faced by SMEs uh, in getting finance. Um, there are a lot of studies out there pointing out that uh, a substantial number of SMEs uh, have to rely on their own working capital um, to fund their manufacturing activities. And a lot of their uh, financing needs are related to trade finance. And a significant number of SMEs are actually part of global supply chains. So as you can see uh, in the graph of here, which captures the situation at the moment. So where you have an anchor buyer uh, who purchase goods from the first tier supplier, and then the first tier supplier goes on to subcontract uh, the the order, purchase order, or source part of the uh, raw materials from the second tier supplier, and then the supply chain goes on. And quite often, these transactions between uh, the parties in the supply chain are conducted on open account basis. So basically, the, the suppliers, they have to rely on their own working capital and savings uh, to fund their uh, manufacturing activities. And that lend, uh, the, the finance uh, period can be very lengthy. And when you look at the supply chain, uh, further down the supply chain of the, say, the tier three, four, uh, five suppliers are quite often uh, SMEs. And they, it is particularly difficult for them to obtain finance in the traditional way because they do not have a direct contractual relationship uh, with the anchor buyer. And they also lack uh, credible collateral or uh, they don't have uh, an established credit record. So with Project Dynamo, uh, we're thinking with the latest developments uh, in tokenization and in blockchain, can the technologies uh, be used to help the SMEs to actually address this very pressing issue. So with that question, we went out and explored with a number of uh, partners in private sector, and we delivered a prototype platform um, built by uh, this company called Linglogis, who is uh, a specialist uh, in supply chain finance and on Ethereum blockchain platform. And 
the as you can see in the graph here um on the platform we envisage that the end so we envisage that all the anchor the anchor buyer and all the suppliers will be on this uh, platform and there will also be a digital token issuer which could either be a bank or could be a non-bank uh, technology company so the thinking is that once the anchor buyer places a purchase order with the tier one supplier, it could at the same time uh, purchase a digital, we call it a digital trade token. Uh, and now I'll come to uh, the backing of the token slightly further down the presentation. So the anchor buyer can purchase a digital trade token from the issuer and transfer that token to the tier first tier supplier and the beauty of the digital token is lies with its programmability. So the anchor buyer could program different conditions uh, onto that token. The condition could be, for instance, time-based. So uh, it could be the, the payment will only happen on a particular date. And the condition could also be action-based. So for instance, the payment would only be effected when an electronic bill of lading has been issued, which means the, the goods has been the goods have been shipped. And the um and the condition could be uh, a, a payment would only be affected if the supplier achieves a certain ESG rating. And so that's a data-based uh, condition. So with all the, so basically the it's entirely up to the anchor buyer to program whatever conditions uh, it want to program onto that token, and and with although with that transfer of the token, the tier one supplier now holds the token, the the amount, um, the fiat currency, the money behind the token is not yet released to the tier one supplier because the payment would only be effected automatically once all the conditions on that token have been fulfilled. But now with that token in hand. The first tier supplier, what, what can it do uh, with that token? Um, we come to the next graph. So the, the first tier supplier could do three things, uh, three things with the token. So it could either hold on to the token uh, until all the conditions are fulfilled, and then it automatically gets paid. The second option is that it can transfer all or part of that token to its own supplier, so i.e. the tier two supplier, to offset uh, the debts that owe to tier two supplier. So for instance, the tier two, the tier two supplier supplies raw materials uh, to tier one suppliers. Instead of uh, paying tier two supplier with, uh, in instead of paying on open account, the tier one supplier could then settle that, that bill with, with the token. And the third option is that the tier one supplier could finance all or part of that token with an institutional investor on the platform before the conditions are fulfilled. So we envisage that uh, on the same uh, on the same blockchain platform, there could be uh, institutional investors who will come forward and who will be interested in taking on uh, the risks. So when we look at when we when we look at the, the situation here, um, basically the institutional investors are taking on two uh, risks. One is the, the credit risk of the anchor buyer because they actually want the, the risk of the, the digital token issuer because um, the token is a liability of the issuer. And the other risk is the performance risk uh, of the SME supplier. So previously or currently, the, the, the banks or investors are less willing to provide finance because they lack uh, visibility on the trade itself. And they also, uh, it's, it's also very difficult, extremely difficult to conduct KYC uh, on the SME suppliers and also to make, a credit to make a check on the credit history of those suppliers. But with the blockchain platform, uh, the institutional investors will have full visibility over the transaction, trade transaction end to end and you would also be able to see that these suppliers, they are genuine suppliers to a very credible anchor buyer. And you will probably be able to see that these suppliers have years of very credible and reliable performances. 
And when we do believe that will in turn uh, incentivize the institutional investors uh, to provide finance and address the issues, uh, the finding, uh, financing issues faced by the SME suppliers. And now I want to quickly talk about the three options. Uh, when we do the prototype, uh, we explore three options of exploring the tokens, uh, of backing the tokens. First of all is uh, the token could be backed one-to-one -one, uh, with fiat currency. And second, it could be backed one-to-one -one by a deposit in the commercial bank. And third, uh, most importantly, uh, backing the token with the letter of credit issued either by uh, the anchor buyer itself or uh, the commercial bank of the anchor buyer. So that the, actually we think about the, the three options. The third option is probably the one with the most commercial viability because at the moment uh, the anchor buyer is buying the goods on open account basis. So it would be quite difficult uh, to, to envisage how they might want to pay cash upfront to obtain the token. So we think by backing the token, uh, with credit, which is a letter of credit, the guarantee, that might be the, the one, the most commercially attractive option of backing the option. But that uh, brings on around a very important question, which is uh, the nature of that token. And we spoke with a number of law firms uh, doing our project. And very interestingly, every, each and every one of them gives a different opinion. So some think it's an electronic bill of exchange, some think it's an electronic promissory note, and some think it's a stable coin or a digital token or the payment token. So that actually draws out uh, a very important lessons learned from the project, which is while innovations uh, can be greatly uh, beneficial to the real economy, it, it would only be possible uh, to derive those benefits uh, on the basis when we have uh, legal and regulatory clarity. And that's why we think uh, the, the, the works that we've done and, uh, at the BIS Innovation Hub and particularly of this particular project really complements the very important initiative uh, undertaken by Ancitro and also the wider work on, on trade digitalization, because here we are really bringing together the digitalization of trade and also the digitalization of finance. And just to quickly highlight that uh, as part of the prototype, uh, we actually linked up the prototype platform with uh, the trade trust platform uh, in Singapore. So that uh, with open API, so that uh, actually we actually tested that uh, uh, EBL, uh, e electronic bill of lading uh, issued on trade trust can actually be fed into our prototype platform for triggering a payment. And we also explored uh, with the private sector entity in terms of using ESG condition uh, to trigger the payment. And also we incorporated electronic KYC functions uh, onto the prototype platform. So that actually concludes my presentation and I will be uh, very happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Lucy. I do have a question which uh, we got through the, 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 the online uh, uh, stream. Based on the, well, that, that question, yes, came back. Based on the link logis, prototype shared, is it right to understand that the DTT is fungible, which means divisible and transferable, and is in essence a conditional payment undertaken by the anchor buyer and financing on the DTT can be provided by any party that has risk appetite for the anchor buyer. Now this shows that we have an incredibly qualified audience. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if I have uh, all the legal background to under answer that question. Well, I think the first question is, uh, is about fungible token. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the if whoever raised that question is right, because when we spoke with uh, representatives from the Web3 world, 
they very much view this digital trade token, or in fact, they view stablecoin and CBDCs uh, at large as NFTs. Um, they are built on the, the same standards, same blockchain standards. Um, from their perspective, they are all uh, non-fungible tokens with different backings, i.e. with different risk uh, levels. So that, that's how they see it. And, and, and it is right to point out that it is, uh, in fact, uh, technically an NFT. And I believe the second question is regarding uh, whether the that means uh, that token means a, 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 a conditional payment, con conditional undertaking uh, of payment by the anchor buyer. So we we worked uh, with um, colleague with um, colleagues from a, a law sector uh, on this prototype platform, and we are of the view that for such a prototype platform to go live. There must be, or there must be. A, it is very likely that there will need, there will need to be a rulebook in governing uh, the functioning of that that platform, which will set out uh, the rights and and responsibilities of each party. So it is like it is likely that in that rulebook it will specify that when a, a, a anchor buyer transfer that token to a supplier, it will. Uh, represent a legal undertaking of its payment, uh, although it's a conditional payment. So, so we believe that yes, it will be, and it, a rule book will be necessary. And one thing that I, I want to highlight, which I, I just realized I didn't manage to cover the during my presentation, is the cross-border uh, implication of using such digital token for trade finance, because trade is very much global in nature. You could have the anchor buy in the US, you could have the first year supply in China, the second year in Thailand, for instance. So how do you, how do you make sure that a token issued in US can be recognized in China and then be funded, for instance, in, in Thailand by an investor, for instance, in Europe? So, so how what's the legal what's the legal uh, classification of that token in each jurisdiction i think at the moment uh, we look into the the current uh, legal and regulatory status in different jurisdictions is very much varied so so the 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 legal uh, clarification of that that token and also the transferability of that token beyond borders really i think determine whether such uh, digitalized trade finance payment can be a, a reality. Which take us to, takes us to the point that we need to adopt MLETR. <laughs> yes. To, 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 because if we all adopt MLETR, we don't have a problem with that. Yes. So that's why I think we, we are a good complement to, to your very important work here. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think that on that note, it is the time to close this first panel. Thank you very much to our speakers. Uh, thank you, Shafak. We see you again online. And uh, we will uh, recommend the uh, forum in about one hour time, 57 minutes time. Thank you. Thank you very much to our uh, moderator and panelists for this engaging and informative discussion. Before we break for lunch, we would like to invite our moderator and panelists to take a group photo. Could our in-person speakers kindly approach the stage? And Ms. Arkueji, please keep your camera on for the photo. Let me give a cue. One, two, three. Thank you very much. We will now be breaking for lunch and, in, and we'll resume at one o'clock for our second panel discussion. Lunch boxes, including vegetarian options, will be served to your table. As the room may not be locked, please take care not to leave your personal belongings unattended. And in case you will be leaving the conference area, kindly keep them with you. 
Lastly, we would like to request the virtual speakers of the upcoming panel to return at 12.45 Korea Standard Time, so we could test your connections during the last 15 minutes of the break. For those just joining us, welcome to the third Incheon Law and Business Forum. Kindly note that we are currently on a one hour break for lunch, and the next session will begin at 1 p.m. Korea Standard Time. both virtual and in-person. Welcome back to the third Intron Law and Business Forum. I'm Tracy Choi, legal expert seconded from um, the Department of Justice, Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. It is my great pleasure to be the event moderator for the afternoon session of the forum. We will now be resuming the forum with our first afternoon panel. The business track panel two will be discussing the topic, military implementation in transport and logistics. It is my pleasure to introduce the panel moderator, Ms. Kenip Patong. In her capacity as Executive Advisor and Chief Information Officer of the Electronic Transactions Development Agency in Thailand, Ms. Patong is responsible for analyzing electronic transaction standards and emerging innovations to invent innovative solutions aligned with organizational strategies. Ms. Patong's work has included many notable projects in the electronic transaction standards sphere, such as the facilitation of the Thai Blockchain Consortium, the adoption of a digital IT for Thai citizens, Thailand's National Digital Trade Platform pilot project, and much more. Mr. Mr. Tom, thank you for taking the time to join us here today and for moderating what I trust will be an engaging discussion. I will now hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very nice introduction. And we'll come back after we have a really good and really wonderful uh, lunch box. Okay, I will start the session in the afternoon with our business track two. Uh, in the morning, we already have the very interesting session, and we can see a lot of uh, implementation in the trade and finance sector. Now, I think we move to another sector, which, which is very important and play a crucial role in the current digital economy right now. Uh, for the business track two, it is about the LETR implementation in transport and logistics. And for today, I think it would be a very uh, interesting session because we have the real practitioners from both public and private sectors. So we can see a balanced view from the policy maker and also from the operators. For the first one, I would like to introduce you to the person from the public sector from Japan. So we can see a movement of the government policies in the digital trade in Japan. Please allow me introduce you, Mr. Ryoji Ishida. He's a Deputy Director, Trade Promotion Division, Trade and Economy Cooperation Bureau from the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, or METI in short, from Japan. The floor is yours. No, no. I, I think it's uh, from Trade Walls. The slide for Mr. Ishida is another set. This is a uh, difficulty after the lunch break. <laughs>
Okay. okay. Uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction, Ms. Katin uh, Kanit. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Reiji Ishida uh, from Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry of Japan, uh, METI. It's a great honor for me to be invited to Rowan Business Forum uh, 2023 uh, as one of speakers. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers of this forum and all of the attendees, either in person or uh, online, uh, for your participation. So uh, you might feel a bit uh, rosy after great lunch, but uh, please allow me to give a pres give my short presentation about approaches to uh, trade digitalization in Japan. Uh, so uh, firstly, let me start with supply chain issue. Uh, as you all know, the supply chain risk has increased in recent years. Uh, you can see so many factors that might endanger uh, current supply chain uh, on this slide. So uh, pandemic, uh, economic conflict, political conflict, exchange rate fluctuations. Uh, various factors make supply chain fragile and uh, unstable in recent years. So to deal with uh, these supply chain resilience risks, various measures have been taken recently. Uh, for example, more companies have been working on uh, sourcing, working on sourcing uh, raw materials from multiple suppliers, and increasing inventory or nearshore sourcing or manufacturing. However, as you know, all of these projects to strengthen their supply chain always come with an additional cost. So uh, companies are required to find a solution to cut down that cost through uh, utilizing a new digital technology. So uh, what about the situation surrounding trade? As you know, there are so many paper-based trade documents. Paper-based trade procedures are still prevalent and regarded as inefficient. Handling all of these trade, uh, these paper-based trade, trade documents take a large amount of time and manuals. In order to digitalize these trade documents, uh, digital trade platforms uh, have been developed in recent years. However, interoperability among these trade platforms has not been established fully yet. Uh, this slide shows what METI is aiming at. Our goal is to digitalize trade procedures and build a resilient supply chain. Uh, digital trade platforms, including trade worlds, have a key role to make this happen, which is shown on the right graphic of this slide. Uh, from the next slide, I would like to talk about three ongoing projects uh, which lead to trade digitalization. First, develop domestic registration based on MLETR. Uh, secondly, trade data linkage based on the international standards established by UNCFACT. Uh, third, facilitating interoperability among trade platforms. So uh, for, as for providing domestic registration for digitalized trade documents, Ministry of Justice of Japan is fully in charge of legal matter. So uh, unfortunately, I might not be the best speaker to talk about this issue. Uh, anyway, let me give you a brief overview of the status on digitalizing bill of rating uh, legally in Japan. According to the survey that was conducted uh, in 2021 on the utilization situation of electronic bill of lading, uh, approximately 25% of shipping company that answered to the survey indicated that they had issued EBRs by utilizing digital trade platforms services such as Borero and s -Docs in the last one year. Uh, However, we found uh, multiple reasons for keep using paper BL and not choosing EBL. For example, they receive requests from clients to use paper BL, or using paper BL is a routine procedure for them and they don't wish to change it. Some of respondents to the survey also pointed out that they, uh, they were reluctant to use EBL without legal basis. So uh, based on the comment I mentioned so far, it, it seems to be a bit difficult for Japanese companies to adopt EBR on their trade transactions. But uh, there were also some respondents who feel the increasing demand for EBR. 
uh, they think EBL could be the solution to the crisis of bill of lading or facilitating, facilitating trade transaction, trade procedures. Therefore, I think they will likely shift to EBL once it is legally adopted. So uh, what about the situation on the amendment of commercial code? As you might know, EBL based on MLETR has not been legally adopted in Japan yet at this point. Uh, the Commercial Code Subcommittee of Legislative, Legislative Council of the Ministry of Justice has been regularly held since April 2022 to discuss the adoption of uh, EBL. From March to May 2023, the public comments were asked for the interim draft on the amendment of provision on BL. There were some positive comments for preparing a law to digitalize BL based on MLETR. One thing I would like to mention at this point is that the purpose of the law amendment is to just allow EBL legally, in addition to ordinary paper BL, neither mandating EBL nor prioritizing EBL over paper BL. So therefore, companies, Japanese companies still have the option to keep using paper BL. These are what I can tell you about the EBL situation. Uh, I just wanted to say the uh, Ministry of Justice of Japan is now working so hard to amend the provision about BL. Uh, let me move on to the next slide. I would, like to talk, uh, I would like to talk about the next step, utilization of international standards. Uh, there are a number of digital trade platforms in both Japan and other countries. Platform users are often required to use or connect with multiple platforms to exchange digitalized trade documents with their trade partners. This could be the huge cost for users to implement multiple interfaces. In order to resolve this issue, we would like to promote the utilization of international standards established by UNCFERC toward all of stakeholders. Once they can exchange data based on the international standard, it's going to be easier for them to build interoperability with each other. On the other hand, it has been pointed out that current international standards are not necessarily up to date. Uh, we hold a working group which was consist of various Japanese companies engaged in trading companies, uh, trading businesses to evaluate the practicality of international standards. In this working group, the data mapping was conducted in the same trade document between data items indicated by the UNC for international standards and data items that companies practically use on their actual business. As a result of the data mapping, it found out that some data items used for actual trade business are not registered on the UNC for international standards. Therefore, Japanese expert team, including uh, Mr. Somaya, uh, have been working on requesting additional data items registration for the UNC for right now. Uh, lastly, I would like to talk about the potential collaboration with uh, other countries for trade digitalization. Uh, without question, it is really important to digitalize trade procedure, not only inside Japan, but in the partner countries. Therefore, our focus is to enhance interoperability among digital trade platforms. We are also willing to assist countries that do not yet have a trade platform to establish it by providing a necessary technology or human capital. This is my last slide. ASEAN Japan collaboration for trade digitalization is one of the main projects we have been currently working on. Digitalizing trade procedures contributes to the cost reduction and resilient supply chain in between ASEAN and Japan. We are currently oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, we are currently working with some regional international organizations such as AMIC and ARIA to analyze the status of trade digitalization in ASEAN countries and to develop a roadmap for the digitalization of trade procedures. We have also been supporting a POC project by TradeWorlds to connect with 
other trade platforms in four countries, uh, Thailand, Singapore, Australia, and New Zealand. This project showed 60% time saving on trade procedure, including paper trade documents. Uh, we would like to use, uh, we would like to keep trying to create more use cases like this and work with other countries to accelerate trade digitalization. So uh, I look forward to further collaboration with all of you guys here who are here, either in person or online today. Yeah. I appreciate it for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ishida. Even though Japan is not yet uh, adopt uh, MLETR, but we can see that Japan government already prepared many things, including the legal reform and also the standard adoption to prepare for the ETR uh, implementation in the future, as well as seeking for more collaboration from all of, uh, many countries around the world. And next, uh, I would like to move to another jurisdiction, uh, another country who has a very uh, big progress in the MLETR. Uh, please allow me to introduce Mr. Ren Yu K from IMDA, Info Infocom Media Development Authority from Singapore. Please, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you, Kun Kani. Uh, very uh, big thank you to uh, Unsitral. Unsitral, RCAT, um, as well as uh, UNC FACT, um, <clears throat> as well as uh, all the guests that are here. I am from the Infocom Media Development Authority, and in a nutshell, we are Singapore's digitalization agency, uh, both from a social as well as economic perspective. Precisely because international trade is so important to Singapore, uh, that's the reason why I'm here today. And that's actually the reason for uh, the time and resources that we devote to this project. Now, in case you're not uh, very familiar with international trade, um, a couple of things to set the tone. First of all, international trade transactions involve long chains of companies most of whom only know and trust their immediate right, counterpoints. And perhaps because paper has had a 2,000 year old head start or 2,000 year head start, it is right now the most interoperable medium there is, right? Unfortunately, it's really hard to determine authenticity and the source of paper documents. Second, We've got varying degrees of digital maturity across the trade ecosystem. And unfortunately, if one part of the chain goes back to paper or relies on paper, well, everybody has to do so as well. Third, even when it is digital, many of these systems are not interoperable. And so uh, you have a very fractured uh, ecosystem. And lastly, of course, before the MLETR, um, there were really only pockets of legal validity of electronic documents, well, transferable ones anyway. So at IMDA, we decided to take a step back and really look at things from a holistic level. And we realized that interoperability is perhaps the key to solving this uh, problem of getting paper out of trade. Now, when you look at interoperability, um, we see it in three aspects. You've got, well, two of them relate to the technical part, and the third relates to the legal part. The first two, data, semantic formats. So the project that we undertake called Trade Trust is payload agnostic, which really means that the users choose whatever data and semantic and formats um, that they wish to put in their in their document, right, in, in the wrapper. And so you've got plenty of these standards out there already. Notable ones in the bill, bill of lading space, DCSA, BIM, BIMCO. Now, where trade trust comes into play is at the protocol layer. And in a nutshell, we make normal documents or otherwise known as verifiable documents and ETRs 
portable and effective across different systems because international trade uh, is a fractured ecosystem with many, many systems therein already. On the legal side, uh, we all know uh, prior to the MLETR, there have been contractual uh, frameworks that have been used to effect uh, not true EBLs, but uh, contractual constructs of bills of lading. And in the future, obviously, we, uh, we are of the opinion that the world can move towards and should move towards statutory law in aligning towards this really good harmonized standard called the MLETR. And lastly, in order to tackle the, I suppose, the uh, problem of having uh, different parties on different parts of the technology maturity curve, the trade trust framework allows for a digital paper bridging mechanism. I've got too little time to go into the details, uh, so please let me know if you'd like more, uh, just approach me. So really what Trade Trust does <clears throat> is it digitalizes the two types of documents in trade, uh, what we call verifiable documents and the other type transferable documents. And it is laser focused on providing three different functions. Two of the functions, authenticity and source, are relevant for verifiable documents. The third function, plus the other two, is uh, that of title transfer and applies to transferable documents. So Trade Trust as a framework is laser focused on providing systems with these three functions. Now, we design Trade Trust with the following principles in mind. Number one, we particularly used a public blockchain. I will explain why we use blockchain in a later slide, but the blockchain that is being used is a public one. Why? So that it's totally transparent with no central governance authority. Second, because it is transparent, uh, because it is public, the data, the commercially sensitive data has to be kept off chain, and it is. Third, payload agnostic. Fourth, the Trade Trust components, the software, is actually provided on open source terms for free. Okay? So anybody and everybody can help themselves to the code. And lastly, of course, it is designed to uh, meet the MLETR requirements. Now, I would like to draw your attention to uh, the banner below, which talks about how Trade Trust, which is built on open attestation, is actually a digital public good that is aligned with the principles for digital development and supports the UN Sustainable Development Goals. This is a very simple picture of what Trade Trust is. So if you look at it, the, com the businesses, the commercial platforms uh, exist on the application layer Trade Trust comes in as a protocol, uh, you could call it a middleware, in order to bridge, in order to be an adapter to many types of blockchain, uh, all public that is, um, in order to handle uh, electronic transferable records. So over here, just to deep dive a bit into um, uh, how Trade Trust achieves the key requirements in the MLETR. We have um, the singularity principle as espoused in the MLETR. We use non-fungible tokens to take care of that. For exclusive control, we've got the smart contract that's running on the, on the blockchain to make sure that, uh, there's, that the right party, the holder and the owner uh, is controlled in terms of being able to transfer that uh, right. Third, the integrity of the electronic record is actually maintained through a combination of cryptographic hashing technology and the use of the public uh, ledger or public blockchain. I was asked to um, review uh, the, the many pilots and um, projects that we've had uh, with many countries. And this is that pictorial view. Um, the most recent one uh, was just completed two weeks ago, 
uh, between India and Singapore, where we worked with the India government uh, to orchestrate our businesses in a live electronic bill of lading used to underpin a live letter of credit transaction between uh, DBS Bank, ICICI Bank, uh, Jindal Stainless, as well as Map Trust Co. I was also asked to share the, the difficulties that we encountered in our projects. Now, I like to think of it as <clears throat> lessons learned. Yeah? Um, so, unfortunately, most non-tech trade people don't really understand a framework or a protocol. Um, they, they certainly get the solution, they, they get a system, but yeah, the eyes just glaze over when I talk about protocol. So many of the time they just say, just tell me what button to press. Just teach me what button. And uh, it's hard to tell them that, well, um, you, have to, you can choose what system you want to use, right? Just trade trust enable that and you know, you're good to go. Secondly, the value of flexibility and freedom of a protocol approach isn't fully appreciated, especially at the start. It's like, you know, if you were the very first person on Facebook, who would you, who would be reading your posts, right? If you were the very first fax machine user, who are you going to send a fax to? And so that whole thing is, and it needs to be engineered, which funnily enough, uh, isn't very apparent or it comes across as, well, that's not very uh, flexible, is it? But nonetheless, the scalability potential of a framework protocol approach is where we have, where now we enjoy uh, SMTP. Now we enjoy being able to email each other by, uh, you know, from the application that we choose. Some people love Gmail, some people love Blue Mail, some people love office, whatever, right? Second, um, <clears throat> we've got different ambitions by different solution providers. Some of them like the, you know, uh, want the one paid for platform to rule everybody. And they would like to be that one paid for platform, obviously. Others are a bit more democratic. Others are more inclusive and say, I want to focus on my user base. I want to focus on my sub-segment and I will work with uh, other people in other sub-segments. And third, uh, the decentralized technologies that we use in Trade Trust, like blockchain, verifiable credentials, are not really understood by the average trade user. But the funny thing is, everybody's using the most decentralized technology right now, paper. So, yeah. Now, even though we've spent about five years on this project, we real, and, and we are focused very much on the bill of lading, we realize that, great, it will help in trade finance, it will help in trade and logistics, but actually, the full potential is not yet known because it can be used for many other ETRs. It, um, you've heard many of the examples today. But imagine when you link other technologies like IoT to the digital bill of lading, to the digital transferable insurance certificate. Yeah, just imagine. Uh, this slide, uh, yes, it's our uh, you know, very proud slide, but I do want to draw your attention to the fact that, as I said, Trade Trust, uh, which is built on open attestation, is actually contributed to the world as a digital public good. And um, it actually is in compliance with the 10 principles of uh, digitalizing trade documents that was covered at the, G at the recent G20 summit. And this is a call to action. Uh, if you want to find out more, there are links there. And uh, that, uh, uh, just give me a soft, sorry, is this my updated deck? Is this version 2? <laughs> there needs to be a version 2. Oh dear. Sorry, I prepared a very interesting surprise for you guys. 
let's Or, <clears throat> or I shan't uh, hold up the panel. I shall uh, reserve my surprise for the next segment that I'm speaking at, which is later this afternoon. So please stick around for that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. K. And uh, I think we are sorry for some uh, difficulty uh, for this uh, session. But uh, I think we can see the hard work from the Singaporean government, even though gov uh, the Singapore already adopted about the MLETR law, but we can see that in order to make it happen, it's not, it's not just only the law. We need to have some other things, for instance, like a technical or some about the strategy for adoption. We can see that from the Singaporean side, they already prepared the framework the very wonderful framework called trade trust that would be uh, really the significant move of the example of the good implementation. But I think we need to learn a lot from the various use case and need time need some time for more evaluation and make it uh, better soon in the future. And right now, I think we can move to the private sector for the operator side. Uh, today, we have the representative from Trade Walls, uh, Mr. Satoru Someyasang. He is um, executive officer, CEO, CMO, and the head of the global and alliance business department and marketing and sales department from Trade Walls. The floor is yours. Thank you, Kenneth Sam, for introduction. And uh, thank you for giving me the chance for the uh, very nice opportunity uh, to speak to uh, with you all the uh, distinguished, uh, distinguished guests and also the online participants and administrators. Thank you for very much. Uh, my name is uh, Satoru Somea from Trade Wars Inc. And also I'm the uh, Japanese committee member of uh, United Nations CFACT. Uh, today I would like to uh, talk about the uh, MRO ETR adopting registration and also the digital trade platform development by trade wars and the government in Japan. And right now, a uh, little bit a sleepy time is coming uh, after the lunch time. So please feel free to uh, do the stretch uh, in my uh, speech, not other uh, sp speakers, but uh, my, uh, in my speak, uh, speech, uh, you can uh, stretch anytime. Yeah. So uh, we, Trade Worlds, is not only the, just the private company, but the uh, combined all Japan uh, company uh, startup uh, collaborated with the uh, academic side and private sectors and also the government's collaboration. And uh, only, uh, the private company's number of uh, shareholders are the 16 uh, of the Japanese big uh, trade industry players. And our mission is to create the uh, uh, create the future of trade. And our supporter of the consortium member is 205 uh, in press release. Uh, it's uh, our collaborator of the uh, Japan, not only Japanese industry, but the global world. So uh, why uh, this kind of the EVR is needed or the digitalization of the document is needed? Because the analog uh, uh, procedure in cross-industry communication, including the BL, invoice, parking list, and other documents are a little bit inefficient uh, in the, uh, some part. And uh, uh, this is the number uh, of the Japan's number. Uh, we need 72 hours uh, for one transaction of the uh, import and export to handle the paper documents or the uh, PDF documents in just one trade. This is uh, 34 times longer than in EU countries right now. And also the annual working cost is uh, reached to the 342 US dollar per trade in Japan. So if the lot of uh, transaction is needed, the cost is highly uh, needed uh, to, for, to operate. And also the uh, status of inventory and the logistics is unclear because uh, all the information is stored in the fragmented area, PDF documents, paper documents, core system, 
or the sometimes uh, uh, shipping company's system. And uh, we need the uh, human resources, but the Japanese uh, population is now uh, decreasing. So the uh, customs knowledge uh, having people is now less. So we need to uh, make uh, efficient, uh, improve the efficiency of the trade uh, to fit the uh, decreasing of the uh, human resources in Japan. So we created the digital trade platform uh, utilizing the blockchain technology hyperledger fabric base, which is called the trade words. And uh, this is connecting all the industry players and also the global cross-border uh, industry players in just one platform and streamline the communication of the cross-industry communication and cutting the time and the cost around the 44 to 47 percent uh, in Japan uh, utilizing by the uh, real user. Uh, we are having the 63 uh, paid users in Japan like the Fujifilm or Mitsubishi Group or the Toyota, Mot uh, Toyota Automobile uh, traders that own. And also the inventory and the logistic status is now clear and no need to for the special knowledge because the traders have the data uh, to support the uh, custom clearance. And this kind of activity cannot be achieved just one, by just one company. So we created a consortium uh, by 17, uh, 18 companies in 2017 and to create the platform, but not only create the platform because the uh, platform doesn't achieve the, all the digitalization. We need the government law change. So we started the government law change activities in 2018 and changed the three times the government's law of Japan. And only one remained is the EBL registration. So we focus on the, uh, this kinds of the EBL road, government law change uh, from 18th and 19th. And uh, that uh, story is now going. And as you can see, uh, that the barring uh, is created, uh, changed the government's law at the first, and also the Singapore and the British. These uh, countries are now changing the government law uh, to uh, adapt the BL registration. But also, uh, as the, uh, Ishida san mentioned, uh, Japan uh, is now uh, going on the uh, progress of the electric uh, EBL registration in Japan. Uh, we, uh, trade words and also the government, are uh, now focusing on the uh, changing the uh, government role. And 2022, we uh, sent uh, the uh, suggestion uh, to change the government law. And uh, uh, hopefully, uh, we can change the government role uh, in 2025 to 2026. And our uh, platform is also created and uh, now launching and uh, getting the 65 paid users in Japan and also the global users, uh, 130 uh, in the global world. Uh, so the, right now, uh, 200 uh, trade industry players are exchanging the uh, trade documents just in data in our platform. And uh, this uh, kind of the activity is strongly supported by the uh, Japanese government and the uh, cabinet office uh, created the policy uh, for the trade digitalization uh, of the procedure in trade industry uh, this year. And also, uh, we need the interoperability. Not only Japan, but the trade has a counterparty country. So we created the system linkage to the uh, APEC four countries uh, of having the uh, trade digital trade platform. Uh, it is already mentioned by the uh, Ishida-san, that's the, uh, Thailand, uh, Singapore, New Zealand, and Australia. And uh, we are now uh, moving to the expanding our activities to other ASEAN nations in 10 countries. We uh, negotiated with the uh, Prime Minister Hun Sen Sang, uh, the Cambodia Prime Minister, and the chair country of the ASEAN uh, in last year. And also, uh, government uh, sets uh, uh, global activity policy to cooperate uh, between the Japan and ASEAN uh, to create the co-creation uh, vision. And uh, this uh, writing, the, uh, utilizing blockchain technology and also the digitalizing the uh, analog process of the commercial, logistic, and the financial flow in the trade industry. So uh, we are like the uh, public and the private sectors uh, partnership uh, act action uh, from Japan. And uh, for interoperable, uh, we need to uh, make the standard uh, for the data uh, to collaborate with the other countries. So we created, uh, we are now uh, moving on to the 
changing the uh, United Nations CFOX uh, data set uh, utilizing these kinds of activities by the private sectors and the pri public sectors. And uh, uh, on October, uh, we will do the uh, second action uh, to the United Nations CFOX. And uh, uh, these days, uh, we are now uh, using non EBL uh, transaction only, and we are uh, expanding to our business to the uh, EBL uh, utilization because the uh, customer right now uh, lays in the uh, EBL expectation, and we need response. Uh, from mining industry, uh, especially, they are requesting us uh, for the EBL. Uh, like the ABL platform, like the ICE, uh, that will be presented uh, next to me. And uh, uh, we are now uh, negotiating with the uh, digital trade platform uh, of the EBL. But also, uh, Trade Trust has the uh, EBL's uh, enabler uh, functionality, so we need to uh, talk uh, after this panel discussion. But uh, this kind of thing. And if we can go to the uh, EVL functionality, we are not only digitalize the paper document, but uh, we can go to the next stage, the value added services. Uh, in the right side, uh, I'm showing the uh, cross chain uh, technology uh, POC results of trade routes. Trade routes can exchange uh, not only EVL, but the VL uh, data uh, inside our platform. This is the uh, blockchain of uh, trade. And uh, our partner, a financial platformer, has the Ethereum-based financial blockchain technology for the digital currency payment. And we can uh, connect these two blockchain technology by atomic swap, the latest technology. So we can uh, exchange the uh, blockchain to blockchain by interoperability. And there's the world's first, first successful uh, exchanging the data of uh, beer, uh, beers uh, uh, transaction and this the uh, digital currency uh, payment project. So uh, EBL uh, is not only the digitalization of the uh, documents, but uh, making the other uh, value added services using the blockchain smart contract together. Yeah, yeah, this is my five minutes, right? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we can see that uh, there are lots of movement from the trade routes platform as well, uh, especially for the interoperability issue, uh, because there are lots of people talking about the, how to interop the document on different on different uh, blockchain platform. Uh, from Sovenya Sang, he can show that he has a POC that can show that you can exchange the document from different blockchain. And importantly, we can see that the partnership between the private and public sector is a key driver for the digital transformation, because uh, according to his uh, pre presentation, we can see that uh, trade ball uh, does lots of work to make it uh, happen, uh, including the partnership with the Japanese government and also the partnership with other um, partnership outside Japan as well. And lastly, uh, we have uh, Ms. Marina Kominos. Uh, unfortunately, she cannot be here with us today, but she will join us from the online. Hello, uh, Ms. Kominos. Can you hear us? I can indeed. Good morning. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Uh, Ms. Marina Kominos, uh, she's from uh, ICE Digital Trade, or we can know it formally as Adults. And today uh, she will help to present about the uptake about the digital transformation status. The floor is your Ms. Kaminas. Thank you very much. And I am extremely sorry that I'm not there today. Um, I hope you can see my screen with my slides. Can we see those now? Yes, we can see your screen now. Fantastic. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much to UNCITRAL and RCAP for inviting me. I'm, as I said, very sad not to be there today, um, but it's my loss. Um, why am I here today? Um, I'm not really going to talk about the legal side. You have fantastic people presenting at this conference uh, who are much better at that than I. Um, the reason I'm here is because we have been providing operational EBLs since 2010. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about the practical side of uh, being an EBL solution provider and the 
fascinating times we are currently transitioning, which is when we're moving from these contractual based EBLs that we've been operating, the world we've been operating in for the last 10 years or so, into a statutory world and the opportunities that gives us, um, uh, predominantly around interoperability, but also uh, the trust that will generate around the uh, ecosystem, which will uh, accelerate utilization. So I think acceleration and interoperability are the two key things around um, using statute based EBLs uh, that we're super excited about. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about where we are today and how we transition from this world where people have uh, been using contract-based EBLs into uh, statute-based EBLs. Um, the one thing that is certain is that change management has always been a critical part of transitioning people from paper to digital. Uh, I think that will continue regardless of whether we're using paper bills or, um, sorry, contract-based bills or digital bills, change management will remain important. We need to make sure that people are supported through that transition. Um, companies have been using paper-based EBLs for so long. There's a, there's a lot of knowledge within companies around that, and we need to help them transition that knowledge into a, a, a digital world. So where were we up until um, recent years when statutes started um, being implemented, and where are we really still today? Um, contract Based EBLs are in use. Um, uh, I know that for some people, uh, they are not um, the equivalent of statute based and they're right. They are a contractual construct, but they're a contractual construct that works well. We have over 9,000 companies currently using contract based EBLs across all commodity sectors, um, all transport modes in 81 countries and across 80, uh, 85, 45 banks. So that's a bit of an idea of where we're active. I'm not doing this as a marketing tool. Um, I think one of the critical parts of transitioning is making people feel comfortable that this they aren't the first people to do it. Um, and so these slides are intended to show that we are already there. We just need to grow. Uh, and growing is enabled with legislation and it's enabled with interoperability across different platforms. So what does the future hold in a world in which statute-based EBLs are, uh, are used? Um, I'm not really going to talk about the future state. The future state is where we will be um, in question mark, question mark number of years uh, when we don't need statute-based EBLs anymore. Uh, what I'd like to focus on is intermediate state, where we are today. Today, we have two of the biggest maritime nations uh, having recognized EBLs. The UK is about 10 days away from doing that. Uh, Singapore did it in 2021. Um, and we need to start utilizing the statute-based EBLs uh, so that people can get a sense of what that feels like and what the differences are to contract-based EBLs. So, and that is a transition and it has its own challenges, but they are challenges we need to grapple with. Um, we, as an industry, whenever government has come to us and said, what do you need in order to digitize? Everyone has said, we need changes in law. Um, it's been the number one response uh, on all these surveys for, for years. Governments are responding to those requests. Uh, we've heard here today about Japanese efforts to do the same. Uh, we know that France and Germany are looking to do the same. Singapore and the UK have already listened and done it. So we then need to um, start utilizing. Let's understand what challenges remain and let's uh, look to find solutions for them, but let's not sit back and say, well, I'm not quite ready yet. So um, we, as an organization, are very keen to start what we call this intermediate stage, this stage where contract-based EBLs live alongside statute-based EBLs, but we're starting to focus on how can we transition and what does the industry need in order to assist that transition? Um, one of the things the industry needs is to understand what reliability means. Uh, the model law, as well as uh, the Electronic Transactions Act in the UK, both talk about um, reliability of a system. The concept of re reliability is very narrowly defined. Uh, sorry, it's very broadly defined. <laughs> um, and it's, it's intentionally technology neutral. Uh, so it isn't meant to ad adopt one form of technology over another in recognition that Today we have three or four modes of technology, tomorrow they might be completely different and what you don't want is the legislation to go stale just because the technology has changed. I'd also like to 
focus on the fact that there's nothing really in that those requirements which should ever cause concern to a solution provider who's been around for a few years. It is not that we're asking of the industry to do anything magical. Um, we want to show that an EBL can't be altered after signature. Well, if it could, no one would be using these solutions. We need to be able to distinguish between originals and copies under the UK Act. Uh, everyone requires um, only one person to have control. All of these things are things that any per any solution that has been uh, providing EPLs to the industry is going to be able to do, otherwise no one would use them. So we need to just find a way of satisfying the industry that that is the case. Um, the, the evidential side, I think, is what's missing. It's not the uh, implementation of these things. And what is critical, and I think we all need to keep an eye out for, is that these this evidence-based side of reliability, how do we prove that we are reliable, has to be international. It cannot be uh, a national standard with national accreditation requirements, because I think that you will kill the industry if that's what happens. And imagine the situation where we as a solution provider had to be accredited in each of the countries where an EBL may be issued, created the governing law of it, um, uh, the destination country, et cetera, where we never know where it might be. And imagine if there are conflicting requirements between those national laws that you can't meet both of them. So it's critical that we do this as uh, an international community because this is international trade and we don't look to localize any of the requirements. Um, the industry is now starting to focus on uh, reliability. Uh, as legislation uh, gets traction, uh, ICC UK, together with the Digital Trade and Innovation Forum, are leading a project uh, which is international in nature. Um, and we are hoping that we'll see some results from that by the end of this year with an, imp uh, an implementation in 2024. So we are watching that very closely. Um, so what do we do in the meantime and how do we progress in this intermediate period? We need to generate trust uh, in statute-based EBLs. And that will be achieved by showing successful adoption and repeated operational scalable use. We've done this before. We did this with contract-based EBLs. When we first started talking about contract-based EBLs, no one had ever used them. No one trusted them. What do you do? You pick out certain areas which are comfortable for people, trade routes that are comfortable, geographic locations that are comfortable, and you start rolling it out. And you show repeated use. Rinse and repeat. Same thing. Go to a new location. Show it again. That is how people get comfortable. It doesn't have to be a big bang theory. What it has to do is show that it can be done. It can be done seamlessly. It can be done more efficiently and it's beneficial and, and it, it, it provides value. Um, so that requires education. It, should, it requires showcasing adoption examples. Um, it, it requires readily available materials to help people in that transition. Um, we have a number of different routes. We're looking to do that now. We're participating in a trial using Singapore law. Um, we're also looking to do the same in the UK, as I said, for us, two key things, adoption and interoperability. Those are the two things that will drive um, uh, uh, the, the digitization of trade. And so those are the two things we focus on in all of our trials. We also focus on doing things that can then turn into operational scalable solutions. We know that we can exchange data with other platforms. We know that we can use contract-based EBLs. What we want to, the industry to see is that we can do that in a repeatable, operational, scalable way so that they can utilize it um, over a long period of time. And we are strongly supported uh, by uh, an industry that's committed to adoption, which is fantastic. Um, the container lines have uh, got the proposal to be 100% digital by 2030, Bulker um, want to be at 25% by 2025. The Fit Alliance recently, yes, I think it was last week on Thursday or Friday, put out their commitment around digitization and EBLs. So all of that is extremely um, uh, helpful in getting us to that next stage. And so that leaves us with the continuing change management challenge. Um, and what that requires is that we need to run two tracks. We're gonna have contract-based and statute-based EBLs for a short period of time until we get to the, how, how many countries do we need to have adopted? The solution providers need to assist companies in change management and companies need to be pushing their governments in order to uh, adopt 
EBR recognizing legislation so that we can move out of this intermediate phase faster. Um, I think we are at a fascinating crossroads in digitizing trade. I've been doing this for 17 years. I've loved every year of those 17 years, but this is probably my best one. Uh, I think that we are finally in that point in time where the industry is focused on this um, and is ready to adopt. And so we have to provide them with all the tools um, to enable them to do that. Um, and as I said, I really think that the one thing that the industry can do is just keep lobbying government to implement the model law. It's a fantastic piece of legislation. It's short, sweet, and to the point. Um, if we all adopt a similar version of the model law uh, and we all um, look at international standards for reliability, we can accelerate adoption um, beyond what we're currently looking at, which I, I, I mean, crystal ball time, I think in five years, we will be um, really in a, in a statute-based world. Uh, but that depends on industry and the, the speed of legislators. Uh, so watch this space. And I thank you very, very much for, for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Ms. Kominas. Um, that's very insightful from the industry side. What is the expect uh, outcome from the government side and what is the uh, movement from the private sectors? Thank you very much. I think we have five minutes left. Um, is there any question from the floor? Um, if there is no, okay, that's one question. Could you please pass the mic? You know, oh yes. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, excellent panel, which is very thought provoking uh, for someone who works in the uh, legal part on the devising a, a conducive legal framework. Um, I was wondering why um, it takes so long to the maritime industry, if I can say maritime transport industry, to move to a blockchain based uh, bill of lading and what i understand was that there were um, several initiatives including by the lloyds i think or um, including by uh, computer companies uh, so i mean the industry should be the one uh, paving the way and not the lawyers the lawyers should be following right what the uh, what the industry wants or what the industry needs so with all the technology that is deployed and that is available how come isn't it's not being implemented faster which would then allow us to sort of put the legal framework around it um, rather than promoting it through a, a legal framework i don't know if it's sufficiently clear yeah which one uh, would like to uh, answer the question why it takes so long to to move i'm happy to take that because it's taken okay, us 17 you. years <laughs> um i think it's a chicken and egg so the industry has been using as i said we've been operational since 2010 uh, but one of their big concerns has been that there isn't a, a, a legal framework for ensuring that the contractual contract based EBLs they use have the same uh, legal uh, validity or effectiveness, uh, certainly internationally, as their uh, statute based equivalents. So uh, there is there, there's a there's there's a couple of things. I think the, the legal concern was one thing. I think change management is a huge thing in international trade. It, there are so many different stakeholder groups involved in one transaction that actually getting them all to uh, transition is quite a challenge. So that change management issue is a thing. Um, legal recognition was a, certainly another thing. So the world kept on saying to the legislators, please legislate in order to give us some comfort that what we're doing is the right thing. And that's when uh, uh, UNSATRAL stepped in. Um, the model law was signed off by UNSATRAL in 2017 um, and implementation really kicked off 2018 with Bahrain, but 2021 really with Singapore. Um, 
uh, Abu Dhabi Free Trade Zone has also implemented it. But um, if you look at key maritime nations where um, bills of lading, governing laws of bills of lading become very relevant at this discussion, right? So what you're looking at is, is the governing law of a bill, uh, does it recognize EBL? So Singapore becomes a, a key uh, jurisdiction and then the UK in 2023. Um, so I think th there's a little bit of both. You mentioned that, you know, why is why the legislators leading it? I don't think they are. I think the legislators have come in to uh, assist. Um, and having done that, uh, they're coming out and saying, okay, we've now given you the legislation you asked for, dear industry, can you please go out and start utilizing it so that we can see um, uh, what else we may need to do or if, if this is sufficient. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Kaminas. Um, I think uh, for this session is very fruitful and we're glad that we have all our speakers here today except Ms. Kaminas. And I think uh, the people in the session will get a very insightful information. Yes, and lastly, please give the round of applause to our speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much to our moderator and panelists for contributing to this captivating conversation about the implementation of Melita in the field of transport and logistics. Um, we apologize for the technical hiccups at the beginning of the session. Before moving on to our next session, we would like to invite our moderator and in-person speakers to approach the stage to take a photo. Um, Ms. Marina Caminos, could you, uh, we, uh, we respectfully ask you to keep your camera on for this moment so that you can also be included in the picture. Thank you. Thank you. One, two, three. One more. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the session. Okay. To keep the momentum going, we will now be moving on to our third and final panel session for today. Business Track Panel 3 will discuss Melita implementation in paperless trade. We would now like to invite our moderator and speaker for this session to join us by coming to the designated speaker's row. It is my pleasure to welcome Ms. Su Hyung Kim, who will act as our moderator for this session. Ms. Kim is an Economic Affairs Officer in the Trade, Investment and Innovation Division of the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. She has extensive experience in the fields of trade securitization, investment and sustainable development, and is currently responsible for managing multiple capacity building projects related to trade digitalization. We are glad that you could join us here today as the moderator for this panel on the topic of Melita implementation in paperless trade. Without further ado, I will hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as been kindly introduced, my name is Sue, and it's my pleasure and honor to moderate this session. Uh, the way that I see it is it's actually building upon the previous session, which was an excellent um, introduction and in-depth uh, dive into the uh, session. So whereas that session was more focusing on the transport and logistics, this will be focusing on the paperless trade. Uh, ESCAP had the privilege of uh, collaborating with uh, Oncitrol for many years on the uh, actual issue of trade digitalizations 
especially through the framework agreement on facilitation of cross-border paperless trade in Asia and the Pacific. So once again, welcome to the session. And um, to save the very valuable time, uh, not to take it away from the speakers, I will not introduce the speakers in details, but all the bios are on the event website. So please refer to that. And let me introduce the first speaker, which is Ms. Juan Jai, General Manager, Legal Department of China Merchants Energy Shipping, CM, CMES China. So she will be presenting on the CMES practice in paperless trade and the uh, very pertinent issue of um, uh, localizing or adapting the MLATI to the uh, domestic legislation. So Ms. Jai. Uh, thank you, Ms. Ki. And uh, I, I, I also, also want to express my appreciation to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share CMES practice in paperless trade and our desire for localization legislation of Malaita here. Uh, I am from China Merchants Energy Shipping College. Ms. Jai, uh, sorry to interrupt, but we are actually seeing the presenter's mode. If you can make it first screen, it will be easier for the participants. Okay, is that a fan? Now it's disappeared. <laughs> oh, I will share it again. Is it fan? Yes, definitely. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry for, for the mistake. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm from China Merchants Energy Shipping Co. Limited, which is the second largest shipping company of China. And uh, uh, the built and Road intelligent trade and transportation chain platform that is a British is being built in line with CMES initiative of smart trade and shipping by technology of the digitalization. And CMES is dedicated to achieve this uh, uh, initiative by promoting the e sliding platform, smart contracts, smart shipment service, and et cetera. And the bridge platform provides one-stop digital service platform with blockchain technology, as follow you, you can see as listed. And uh, uh, it's a platform with the blockchain technology with the function of one-stop uh, the e providing digital service and also, also any other interaction functions uh, such as uh, uh, the smart contract, the vi visual logistic tracking, and also behavior monitoring and other uh, business collaborations and interactions among stakeholders in trade and the shipping industry. And this is a whole picture of the Brit platform structure. Ideally, the Brit platform enables to provide one-stop digital service uh, covering international trade, shipment, and logistics for service, cargo management, also the payment. And here is one case for uh, vehicles exported from China using British pla um, platform. <clears throat> you can see a uh, eBay flooding was issued for carriage of uh, vehicles to Middle East at the uh, eBay flooding system by blockchain technology and transferred to the receiver within two days only. When efficiency was significant, uh, significantly improved, we also provide the set service just such as the ship status tracking with warning of bad weather at sea. And uh, now Britain is applying for the approval of the, the international group of PNA clubs, that is the PNA group. We all know from um, 20th February 2010 liabilities arising in respect of the carriage of cargo and the paperless trading systems can be covered by PNI clubs, provided that the system can first be approved by the PNI group. And since then, the group has approved 10 electronic paperless systems. Uh, with the about ongoing practice, we deeply appreciate the necessity and the feasibility of localization legislation of writer 
established, uh, especially on the following aspects. And the first aspect is uh, uniform standards, as many of our speakers has mentioned. The general reliability standards set forth in Article 12 of letter and uh, specific standards such as a criterion to assess integrity contained in Article 10 of letter provide uniform parameters, not only for national legislation, but also for assessing the reliability of an electronic transferable record and of its management system by the group or the authorities to approve its using. And the second aspect is considering the limitation of the agreement. Uh, we, we all know without legislation, the legal effect and the functional equivalence uh, rely on all the related parties signing an agreement for using of electronic uh, transferable records or the se relevant system. But on one hand, the, the agreement is non-binding uh, on non-participants. So, um, uh, as if uh, as for the non-participants, such as a bank, uh, cannot accept the documents as a document title or as a security as a matter of course. And on the other hand, we know for a claim brought in tort, the agreement cannot come into play. And the third aspect is a non-discrimination principle under Malaysia. We know according to uh, Article 19, uh, uh, electronic transferable records shall not be denied legal effect or validity or enforceability on the sole grounds that it was issued or used abroad. Uh, this is uh, aiming at eliminating obstacles to cross-border recognition of electronic transferable record or arising exclusively from the fact that it's issued or used abroad. And uh, the words used uh, or issued aim at covering all events occurring during the life cycle of uh, electronic transfer record. And uh, the third uh, aspect uh, is uh, we think there is already foundation for localization leg legislation. Uh, we know like China, many countries have finished the local uh, legislation on electronic commerce and electronic signature based on um, ancestral model law and have the foundation uh, for legislation based on Malaysia. And uh, we all know international trading and shipping is borderless and uh, relevant uh, 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 electronic uh, transferable documents will circulate around the world. And meanwhile, the management of electronic transfer records will use equipment and technology located in various jurisdictions. So uh, the local Legislation legislation of Malaysia will definitely facilitate the cross border use of electronic uh, transferable documents and further promote development of international trading and uh, shipping. Uh, about uh, my sharing, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Ms. Jai. Um, you have uh, again um, pinpointed the importance of the interoperability and the importance of um, Melita and other modern laws of uh, Ancitro in order to really harmonize and establish the cross-border exchange of uh, transferable uh, records, which has been um, repeated over uh, over the past sessions, but I think it is very important not to like really um, remember the basis. So with that, uh, if there are any questions from the floor as well as from the uh, virtual participants, please put it in the chat and we will be picking it up at the end of the session as feasible. So now uh, let me introduce my second speaker, Mr. Craig Alan Labs. He's the head of global trade, Kupang, Republic of Korea. Kupang is Amazon equivalent in Korea. Every single person in Korea knows Kupang. So quite uh, looking forward to hear. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Could you hear me okay? All right, good afternoon. Yeah, so I, I joined Kupang about two and a half years ago. 
was with a similar c uh, company in the US. And so really what I'm here to talk about is the, the current state of business and paperless trade in Korea. And so for us, I'm gonna do a quick introduction on Coupon, what we're doing right now with the Korea Customs Service and the current retail business, you know, the, the state of paperless trade today. So for us, what we see is, the, you know, the e-commerce segment or the e-commerce business growing from 466 billion to 547 billion in 2026 in Korea. And if we really look at this, um, coupon continues to, to, to move items cross border. So this growth and, and, and for us, the key, I'll say bottleneck today is, is customs. It's, so it's how do we make a more streamlined approach, approach to logistics and paperless trade. Um, and so that's why we've joined forces or are working with KCS on a number of different projects to streamline the import process and, and, and the, uh, and the clearance time for uh, goods moving cross border. So Coupon, you know, we're in 11 cities, Korea, Taiwan, the US, China. We've got 18 million active customers plus. Uh, we are investing in our small and medium sized enterprises and we're the, are the third largest employer here in Korea. Um, I'm not gonna go over all these, but the second one is, is really what was most intriguing to me, right? You know, 70% of the population live within seven miles of a coupon logistics center. So it's how could we get goods here? And then how could we get them quickly to our customer? Right? I mean, as, as you see, you know, our goal is to move goods from the US to our customers doors within days. And so we strive to, to, to get those items once ordered on a plane and through the, the customs and, and logistics process to your door, timely and efficient. Um, a number of different services, I'm going to jump a few slides and, and really Here's where the meat of it is for us, right? You know, we've, we've cooperated with the, the Korea Custom Service on an MOU. The goal for us is to transmit orders and transactions info to, to KCS prior to the goods arriving. So what, what they're asking of us, Coupon Corp, is, hey, give us what that customer ordered. Craig is sitting in Korea, what did I order? They want to then match it with the import data. If, that, if, the, if those match between the export, the, I mean, the, the platform data, and the import data, they're gonna let those goods be streamlined through the import process. Um, so they're looking for dangerous goods, they're looking for other illegal items, but the, the, the goal of our, of our collaboration is to have those goods clear within 30 minutes. Today is taking hours. So if the, if the platform data matches the import data, the goods should have a streamlined import process. And all this is paperless, right? I mean, we're sending, EDI information to customs, brokers are sending list information, uh, you know, paperless uh, documentation or, or paperless information related to the import to customs. And if those order, if that order information matches, why does it need to sit? Why does it need to go through an X-ray process? Why does it need to go through several other processes? So, you know, customs is looking at how do we partner with large importers to streamline this process, make it paperless, but really matching the platform data with the import data. Um, and so really, what's the current state? So today, everything is pretty much paperless for us, right? I mean, it's a B2C model. Yeah. And so, um, you know, for us, what we're seeing is um, our, I'll say our sister brother companies in, 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 in the US, China, they are cooperating with, with customs as well. And really, if you look at this process, right, everything that's coming from a B2P, B2C perspective goes through one centralized custom system, Unipass. So all brokers are passing this information through the Unipass system, it's paperless, um, right? Uh, so really the, 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 the key bottleneck here is how do we make sure that it's, it's streamlined through that process? There's two elements, the, the import here in Korea, it's one, the paper documentation and two, the X-ray. And so if we could get away from that X-ray process by having partnered with customs that will then streamline the whole customs process um, and, and allow us to, to meet those customer expectations. So again, if you look at this, this depiction, right? I mean, for us today, I'm gonna say 95% of goods go through customs in a, in a completely paperless manner. Um, there are a couple different other types of, of, of import processes, this is the, the, the list clearance process, but there's a general process too, which has more complicated, I'll, I'll say, um, data elements. Um, but for us, with our partnership today with KCS um, and with this paperless trade environment, 
we believe that the, that the future um, will allow customs to target um, companies or individuals who are trying to get around or import stuff that are that is a, a, more of an illegal manner. Um, so what we see is companies like Coupang, like other e-commerce companies really partnering, 11th Street is also partnering with them um, to drive this paperless environment. Now I'm gonna go back one slide, right? And so, you know, if we look, it's just not KCS that's doing this. You know, you look at in the US, other e-commerce companies are partnering with, you know, the US CBP or, or China Customs Service, because the end goal is how do we do everything paperless? There's no need for a customer to have to hold a document for five years, right? I mean, years ago, we all had to have that paper document in a file with you know the invoice, the packing list, everything, right? So today it's, it's how do we um, drive to a paperless automated environment where brokers and forwarders are able to hold documentation to support what they've done on our behalf. So to me, from a customer's perspective, we have come leaps and bounds in the 15, 18 years that I've been involved in, in global trade um, to now see this sort of streamlined paperless environment um, purely from a customer's perspective. I know in other realms, that we're talking about today from a logistics standpoint, there are still, uh, there still is a ways to go, but from a customer's perspective, the, the, the process today is, is much different and streamlined than it was five years ago. And I think the automation and partnership with customs will allow a more streamlined and efficient approach in the future as we look you know, to, to really drive, um, I'll say to, 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 to get rid of certain processes like x-ray, we, we, which we see here is the biggest bottleneck today. Um, and that's all I have. Okay, short and sweet. Thank you very much, Craig. It was quite interesting to hear that uh, there are many customs authorities who are uh, really uh, acting on risk management systems, yes. including pre-arrival information and all that. But what you have actually uh, stressed is not only the automation of the systems, but also the partnerships between the commercial sectors and the customs. Uh, so I think that's a very good lessons learned. At, at the first, it's, it's key, right? I mean, they really want to understand um, what that customer ordered and ensure that what the platform is saying Craig ordered from the US is actually what the seller is saying Craig ordered too. Because what we do see is we've ordered, I'll say, off of other platforms and items don't match. I, I ordered a, I ordered uh, a toy and it came in as a shirt, right? And so it came in as something else. So customers really wants these items to match and that will allow a streamlined approach to, to, to the import process. Okay, no, yeah, uh, quite interesting. So risk assessment management uh, from the customs to be matched with what, what information that you have. The platform has, the platform yes, has. Yeah. okay. So with that, uh, to Craig and the other speakers, heads up, uh, one of the questions that can would be asked at the end of the session is what about effective and sustainable risk management and controls? So that could be part of the yes. answer. So thank you very much. And then let me now move on to the next speaker, Miss Anastasia Alex Alexandro. Gaia. Uh, she is the Senior Legal Expert, International Transport Activity Division, Legal Department, JSC Russian Railways of Russian Federation. So she'll be talking, uh, focusing on rail and multimodal electronic transport documents, along with uh, furthering development of consignment nodes within additional functional function as letter of credit. So uh, Ms. Anastasia? Yes, I'm here. Do you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Hello, Anastasia. We cannot. We cannot hear. Do you, you hear now. me? Yeah. Do you hear me? Yes, I can now. Uh, yes, but uh, just give me one second because I I I, uh, I don't know what's going on. I can't share the screen.
here. Just one second. Sorry, I'm terribly sorry, but maybe it's uh, it will be uh, better if you share my presentation if yes, possible. We because can. I don't know. Thank you very much. Yeah. So can we share from our side? Yeah. Thank you. We are ready to share. So you just okay. say next when we need to. Okay, on. I will say just next. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, good day, everybody. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to take part in this important meeting. And uh, when we talk about digitalization of documents for international transportation, we need to remember the international legal framework as its uh, uh, most important component. Since my uh, professional activity is related to railway transport, uh, let me give a, a brief overview of uh, what is going on in the field of uh, the regulation in the, uh, of the railway. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> The uh, uh, main uh, legal basis for uh, railway uh, transport, uh, international railway transport, uh, is the agreement uh, on international uh, railway freight communication. It's called SMGS. And uh, this agreement establishes direct international railway traffic for freight transport between 26 countries in Europe and Asia. The uh, uh, recent uh, uh, parties to the SNRs are uh, uh, Lao Republic in 2021 and uh, Republic of Korea uh, from uh, the beginning of next year. Next slide, please. Here is the scheme, uh, the map of the railways uh, of the uh, country, uh, of the railways of OGD, uh, which uh, implies the SMGS uh, agreement. Next slide. Uh, next, thank you. Uh, SMGS uh, agreement contains a definition uh, according to which uh, a direct international uh, rail ferry traffic the multimodal, the only multimodal uh, construction, legal construction of SMGS right now, uh, it uh, is a carriage of goods by a railway traffic assigned by waterway transport. Uh, and uh, right now there is a, a working group, uh, a new working group, uh, and which aim is uh, to extend the, this rule not only for rail, uh, railway uh, tr uh, ferry traffic, but also for uh, rail water or sea traffic. Next slide, please. Uh, the other important issue that is regulated by SMGS is that the implementation of electronic documents. Uh, it says that uh, the participants uh, to the carriage uh, may realize uh, the rights and commitments not only by paper documents but also by electronic documents. And uh, the consignment note itself uh, may be completed as a, not only as a paper, but on, uh, also as an electronic consignment note. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, SNGS uh, didn't create a mechanism for confirming, uh, the, uh, for confirming the equivalence of electronic documents that are attached uh, to the consignment note. So not the consignment note itself, but all other documents uh, that the uh, but all other documents uh, 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 that are used for the uh, carriage by railway in article 22 uh, this question uh, this question to the purpose for electronic consent note is results uh, so uh, that the <clears throat> uh, the consignor uh, does not attach to the consignment note a document but uh, it can send 
this document to the relevant administrative inspection body. So if the document is electronic, it is being sent in electronic form, or if there is no possibility to make these uh, additional documents to the, uh, uh, for, for, for the purpose of carriage in electronic form, they can be uh, done even in a paper form and uh, they should be sent to the relevant, uh, relevant administrative inspection. Uh, carriage, unfortunately, sometimes is not successful. Uh, uh, so um, the SMJS contains the rule according to which the claims may be made uh, not only in paper form, but also in electronic form. And uh, this is allowed uh, by the agreement of the parties, participants to the carriage. Next slide. Uh, in uh, 2019, uh, there was uh, founded a new working group uh, uh, on document of title uh, of SMJS. Uh, this group is led by the People's Republic of China. Uh, and the aim uh, of this group is to give the SMJS consignment note the function of document of title. Uh, right now, according to the project, uh, the SMJS bill of lading, it, 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 I shall call it bill of lading, but uh, also it is this, uh, it is being uh, considered to for the future uh, to use uh, the concept not uh, of SMJS consignment uh, bill of lading, but of the SMJS negotiable way bill. <clears throat> the SMJS bill of lading uh, should be issued in addition to the SMJS consignment note. Uh, and uh, it is supposed to, um, that the SMJS uh, bill of lading uh, should be in order bill of lading and doesn't use, uh, that doesn't apply the use of their negotiable instrument. The working group uh, noted the possibility of uh, using this new bill of lading, not uh, only in the scope of SMGS, but to extend it to the uh, SIM uh, sphere. Next slide, please. What's going on in the another legal um, sphere, uh, which is regulated the uh, uh, international carriage of goods uh, on the platform of uh, uh, OTIF, the depository of the SIM rule? Uh, SIM rules, uh, also, uh, uh, like uh, SMJS rules, uh, are legal basis for SIM SMGS, uh, SMJS consignment note. And uh, these legal regimes at least um, must provide or do not preclude the use of negotiable transport documents. But uh, right now, in Article 6 of SIM rule, <clears throat> it is provided that the consignment note shall not have the effect of a bill of lading. Uh, the majority of OTIF members, uh, as I said, the depository of uh, TIM, uh, TIM rules, uh, declared that it is not necessary right now to regulate the use of a negotiable transport document for carriage of goods under the same rule. Uh, the ad hoc committee of OTIF adjourned its decision uh, on the need to regulate the use of negotiable transport documents and to cooperate with OJD right now on this subject. But also, uh, uh, but uh, uh, always uh, there is a small loophole. So right now, the Article Six of SIM rules uh, provides that the international associations of carriers shall establish establish uniform <coughs> model consignment notes in agreement with the customers. In that question, <coughs> SIM committee and OHD committee may implement some relevant changes to the SMJS consignment note on the existing uh, SIM rules. Next slide. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> the uh, potential use of uh, SMJS consignment note as a letter of credit uh, was discussed uh, for, since, uh, to, since 2019. Uh, because the problem is that right now the consignment note notes both SIM SMGS and SIM SMGS are not accepted by banks uh, as a sufficiently secure document for documentary credit. So the task is uh, to supply the consignment note with additional functions as a letter of credit. 
And uh, while, uh, as I have already said, the SIM rules provisions did not uh, didn't prohibit the issuance of a separate negotiable document. So this work can be continued uh, on the platform of two organ of these two organizations. This next slide. Next, next please. Next slide, please. I don't see. Sorry. No, 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 previous, previous, please. Okay, the question uh, of uh, electronic consignment note uh, also was discussed for several years, and the result, um, uh, there is uh, an, a version of uh, uh, functional, legal, and technical specifications for Teams and JS electronic consignment note. It can be, uh, it, it is available on uh, CIT and OEGD um, websites in several languages, including Chinese. Uh, and uh, Let's see what work is carried out outside the scope of faction of SNGS and SIM uh, and on the platform of other international organizations. Almost simultaneously with the proposal to change the SMJS in terms of document of title, uh, People's Republic of China submitted a proposal to the UNC trial. The proposal of uh, People's Republic of China is uh, to develop a legal framework for negotiable railway consignment note as a bill of lading, or as I have already said, a negotiable way bill. Uh, this uh, work, uh, uh, the aim of this work is to create a transferable, tradable, dig digital uh, transport document for multimodal uh, freight movements using multiple modes of transport, including rail. Uh, as I have already said, SMJS consignment node has its electronic form and is, is used for a multimodal uh, rail ferry uh, transport. And now it's in the process of uh, new uh, of adding new function for C rail C uh, movements, but uh, SMJS consignment note uh, doesn't have its function as a document of title. Next slide. Uh, unlike the ocean, I don't see if the slide has changed. Sorry. Can you put the next slide, please? Do you hear me? Uh, sorting out the technical issues, just bear with us for one, one ah. second. Ah. Ah, okay, 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 thank you. Next one. Oh, no, no, the previous, previous. <clears throat> Unlike the ocean uh, pill of lading, as I've already said, the railway consignment note uh, didn't serve as a document of title. That was the problem. Uh, and the limited function of uh, railway uh, consignment note also constrained the ability of banks to use it for the financing uh, of letter of credit. So uh, uh, the Central Working Group uh, based on China's proposal took up a new work uh, towards the development of a new instrument on negotiable cargo documents. And basic principles for this work uh, are that limit 
the scope of application, since the issuance in parallel of a negotiable transfer cargo document uh, issued by a contractual carrier and a transfer document issued by an actual carrier. And uh, that would better reflect the dual tracked approach uh, adopted by the draft of the document. Next slide. Ah, yes, here it is. Uh, the draft uh, new document uh, didn't affect the application of any international convention or national law relating to the regulations and control uh, of transport operations. So this new document should be uh, issued in addition to the transport document itself. The new draft instrument didn't modify the risk and obligations of a transport operator and um, the negotiable uh, cargo document didn't replace transport documents required uh, to be issued under mandatory law. <clears throat> and all, not only by mandatory law, but also by uh, standard uh, trading terms and conditions that are used by uh, participants to the contract. Uh, the project uh, of UNCITRAL also addresses to important issue of the form uh, of the future document. Uh, that was uh, general support for attaining detailed provisions uh, on negotiable electronic cargo records and uh, noting that such an approach uh, would be forward looking. So uh, it should be used not only in paper, but also in electronic version. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Uh, the uh, adoption of any international uh, convention uh, made it always be a quick process. So the last but not the least project that I want to mention is the project of UNSCOP. Uh, the UNSCOP took the path of development uh, of uh, legal frameworks uh, and uh, to uh, harmonize, uh, harmonize legal environment for multimodal transport in the region. The expert group of UNSCOP considered in detail uh, the proposed uh, options for harmonization of multimodal legal frameworks in the region and describe any type of transport operations carried out by two or more modes of transport. Next. Uh, the, color, uh, the current legal uh, regime covering international multimodal uh, transport is fragmented, uh, lacks uh, uniformity, and is difficult to apply. I don't see the slide, sorry. Uh, various liability limits uh, create uh, a gap uh, between damages from sub for uh, contractors and liability to the consumer. So development of a regional guideline for communization of national law is the task of UNSCOP uh, project. These guidelines may be used as a checklist of uh, the main uh, thematic methods, uh, matters and issues uh, which should be considered for inclusion in national laws and multimodal transport. So here are the um, uh, main uh, projects of several international organizations which uh, have the same aim uh, to make the document uh, for international transportation uh, an electronic on the one side and uh, on the other side to uh, supply it with a function as the document of title. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ms. Alexandrovskaya. So you talked about the Agreement on International Railway Freight Communications, SMGS, and the potential SMGS negotiable way bill instead of SMGS BOL. You also were touching upon the um, ESCA project on multimodal transport operation. So both of the things I think you're, uh, you did highlight once again, the importance of uh, harmonizing the legal regulations for supporting these, um, uh, these 
viewers and other other um, documents and data exchange. So thank you very much. As I've said, all the questions I will address at the end of the session. So I will invite the next speaker, Ms. Andrea Tang, Head of International Trade and Law Unit Operation, International Federation of Freight Forwarders Association, FIADA. Ms. Tang. Uh, Andrea, can you hear us? I think we lost her. Uh, give us a minute before she reconnects. We we'll just wait for thirty more seconds. I am told that she is rejoining. Apologies for the technical issues. Okay, unfortunately, I think we cannot retrieve her at the moment. So what I would do is, uh, can I just double check is, if Ms. Jai is still with us? Uh, yeah, uh, Ms. Kim, I, I can Thank hear you. Thank you. And Anastasia, are you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I can. Thank you. So what I do is, uh, minus Andrea, unfortunately, I will pose uh, a few questions to the speakers, which has been posed through the chat. So I'll read the f um, one by one. So first one, um, this is quite interesting. Do you consider admissible the use of certain apps for digital signatures between the parties to contracts and agreements? to give value to the final document. Um, I think it, this wasn't particularly um, 
pointed during this session, but if any of the speakers would like to pick up on this question. If not, I'm actually forcing some of the other sessions would actually pick this um, particular matter. There's another question about how do you deal with data quality, accurate, complete, and data structure? And to what extent is the quality of data affected by the fact that the data is interoperable? Any speakers would like to pick that up? I mean, for customers. Uh, I, um, okay, uh, I'll go with Craig first, and then I'll move to Ms. Jai. I mean, from a customer's perspective, it's it's pretty simple, right? I mean, either you've got the data elements that, that are actually going to fulfill the, the, the responsibilities of, of an importer to actually clear those goods. Um, and again, you've always got that third party to communicate with that importer or overseas agent. So, um, you know, that communication is, or the, the, the data is, is always necessary or else I can't clear. And so for us or for um, our sellers, um, their, I'll say, third party agent is always there to, to help or assist with the, se the seamless integration with customs, but also, you know, data quality uh, as, as well. Okay, so Craig has mentioned that uh, it would be the customs authority and the compliance to that uh, regulations. So, uh, Miss Jai, you wanted to say something, I hear. Uh, I think it's not me raising hand, but uh, I want to explain a little about the data quality. Uh, yes, yeah. please. Uh, yeah, because um, as I understand, uh, under blockchain uh, eBay flooding system or platform, uh, all the participants will uh, send the user agreement first and uh, be reviewed and uh, be uh, be uh, accepted as a, a participant. And at this time, it is will be uh, reviewed and uh, and this, uh, and, and then later, all the uh, data provided by the participant will be reviewed used and accepted by all the relevant participants. So uh, I think during this process, the quality of the data will be reviewed by all the relevant particip participants. So it can keep uh, to ensure the quality of the data. <laughs> I'm not a, a, a technical expert. Uh, it's, it's my understanding. Thank you. OK, thank you very much for picking that up, Ms. Jai. Um, now, uh, I am told that Ms. Tang is with us again. Can I give a final try with her? Andrea? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay. Okay, I'm very sorry about that. I'm joining on my phone now, so sorry for the, um, the lack of a good background. <laughs> Um, but I would be very grateful if you could share my slides um, on my behalf, as I can't really do that on the phone. So thank you very, very much for having me here today. And um, thanks again for your patience. So I'm going to be addressing a little bit more about um, what Fiat is doing um, as the global voice of freight forwarding and logistics to foster digitalization in the logistics supply chain, um, principally focusing on um, our work to digitalize uh, trade documents and to foster interoperability in the supply chain. So um, next. So as an introduction to FIAT, so FIAT works at the international level to represent service providers who operate in trade logistics and supply chain management. Um, we do this through a number of different areas, um, in particular through advocacy, through our work with the FIAT documents, which I'll talk to you more about and the digitalization around that. Um, we also do a lot of training in education, sustainability, and really promoting trade facilitation and best practices among the freight forwarding community. So uh, next. Uh, yeah. Um, so just to give you a quick overview, uh, we are made up of around 109 association members all around the world. Um, also around 6,000 individual members, the individual uh, freight forwarding um, and logistics companies. 
and uh, overall serving in an industry of around 40,000 freight forwarding companies worldwide in around 150 territories. So um, as you can see, we also have a number of different institutes and working groups, advisory bodies, um, standing committees, and we really try to have a good global outreach through the work of our regional committees as well. Next. So um, I think that we have already discussed uh, throughout the, the session some of the of the aspects that make digitalization so important for the logistics supply chain. Um, we can see, for example, digitalization being very important for trade facilitation, for optimization and efficiency of processes, for greater visibility, integrity, and transparency um, if it's done correctly, um, access to a connected and trusted ecosystem. And ultimately, um, it can be a very big contributor to economic growth given the great efficiency and um, cost savings that it represents. However, at the same time, we still see a number of key challenges that remain in order to fully, fully embrace the potential of the digital trade um, evolution. Um, in particular, technology continues to outpace governmental policy and regulation. Some jurisdictions continue to rely very heavily on paper-based processes, and even when uh, we've seen that even when jurisdictions have adopted legislation that is favorable to the digital environment, there have been uh, many instances where um, regulatory processes haven't really been fully adapted, so there have been, um, you know, uh, requests for manual manual processes and, and paper um, requirements to be done in parallel to the digital um, digital requirements, which can sometimes be a little bit counterproductive um, and, and not so efficient yet. So I think that we're still very much in this transition phase. Uh, and also there's really a lack of global harmonization um, still in the approach to digital processes and documents in international trade. And we see that as well very much from a legal perspective. Next. So Fiat's digital strategy uh, is really uh, made up of six projects, which are aimed at facilitating data exchange between freight forwarders and their, their stakeholders. And it's really focusing um, at it from a very much a multi-stakeholder approach. So really looking at it from a very holistic perspective and trying to integrate the different um, interests, the different stakeholders across the supply chains so that we're really not operating in a silo and trying to ensure that we do this really with interoperability in mind. So in terms of the six different projects, we have the Fiat Digital Identity, the Digitalization of Fiat Standard Trade Documents, Document Certification and Digital Signatures, Professional Trusted Networks, interoperability and business intelligence. And all of these six projects are in various stages um, because we're very much, we're very much been focusing in particular on one and two at the moment. But then of course, that's really, really um, plays into the other areas as well. And, um, and we're really trying to support this work from a very much a legal perspective through FIATA's work to push for interoperability legally um, and to ensure that there is a supporting legal framework as seen with its work to promote the MOETR and also its work at the UNSTRAL level to really try to work towards um, a framework that facilitates negotiable multimodal transport documents and uh, both in paper and digital form. And next. So just to give you a bit of an overview of FIATA standard trade documents, I mean, these have been around since 1968 and FIATA has established these standard trade documents really with the aim of harmonizing the documents and forms used by freight forwarders and ensuring that there is this kind of level of um, reputation, integrity in these documents that, that are used. Um, and so we have the, um, on the right, you can see we have the negotiable Fiat Multimodal Transport Bill of Lading, which is very much, um, I suppose, one of the most used documents um, of, out of all the Fiat documents. And we will go into um, a bit more detail later on about how we're digitalizing this, because that's the one that we've been focusing principally on digitalizing first. We also have the non-negotiable Fiat Multimodal Transport Way Bill. The Fiat Forward Certificate of Receipts, the Fiat Warehouse Receipt, and and so on. So we have a quite a, a number of documents which we are slowly working to digitalize now after the Fiat Bill of Lading. Um, next, so. 
In terms of why uh, Fiat's documents are so important for the industry, so uh, we're very much focused on multimodality. And that's um, in particular because freight forwarders are, as uh, we like to call um, ourselves, the architects of transport. Um, we're really the ones who are able to try and organize transports across the different modes of transports and to try and do so in the most efficient and most effective way. And so inherently, that means that we need to have uh, more transport documents that are able to cover the document, uh, I mean, the, 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 the shipment's um, journey from A to B, which means that it might go through various different legs along its way um, between A to B. And um, the freight forwarder's role um, has evolved over time to really be responsible um, as a principal for that journey from the moment it receives that's the goods to the moment the goods are um, subsequently received by the receiver. Um, and so as a result, the Fiat Bill of Lading has been designed as such to be really be able to cover this, this entire journey, irrespective of which transport modes are used along the way. Um, and I, one of the big selling points of the Bill of Lading is also that it's highly recognized worldwide. And because it's so well recognized internationally, it really provides the possibility for small and medium sized enterprises to have access to this well known reputable document, even if they don't have, for example, the capabilities to 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 um, have their own document in house to have their own their own um, brand house bill of lading, they're able to use this bill of lading, which is according to the UNCTAD ICC standards. And it also has a certain number of compliance requirements um, that are um, in place should a freight forwarders wish to use the document, which also includes the need for verification um, by FIATA's association members. So there is this layer of trust there, which is already existing in the paper world. But um, in the paper world, we see that there are a number of challenges to really being able to maintain these high standards and being able to ensure the, um, the trackability, the, um, the reliability of these standards and so we really try to enhance this and strengthen this in the digital realm um, and also finally in terms of in general the negotiable nature of the fiat bill of lading is that it provides for important access to finance um, so it can be used to access a letter of credit although of course as we've seen it with the work with UNSTRAL, this is something that is still a very much a work in progress in terms of how um, banks view uh, multimodal transport documents in general just because of the of the um, absence of a harmonized legal framework and legal response to this um, but technically Technically, it is negotiable, so it can be used to, uh, to draw a letter of credit. Next. So in terms of Fiat's work to digitalize... Andrea, sorry, but we are running out of the time, so if you can just wrap up. Sorry for the interruption. Okay. All right, so I will try and be quick. So um, in terms of digitalizing Fiat documents, so we have an open source solution um, to digitalize the bill of lading as mentioned, and it's really working to issue the bill of lading through the everyday tools of freight forwarders. And it can be done, it can be used either fully digitally or it can be done by converting to, it can be converted to paper as well, depending on the jurisdictional requirements. And one of the big benefits is that we have the Fiat Digital Identity, which allows um, for freight forwarders to be able to um, to be certified um, with a digital identity and to then be able to operate in a trusted network and to exchange data with peace of mind, ac accessing a digital global ecosystem. Next. So in terms of um, the uh, standards, so I think we've already we've already discussed a little bit about this, that it's very important to have standards in the digital world that actually are interoperable and speak to each other in the same vocabulary and format. Next. And um, so in terms of FIATA's, um, FIATA's documents, so each document is registered in, in an immutable ledger protecting um, against fraud and allowing um, for the ability to verify the document's validity. And um, through the FIAT digital standard, we can see that the data can be exchanged according to UN data standards and tracked um, by an audit trail using the digital entity. Next. 
So here's just a few um, selling points of the digital BL versus the printed BL. Um, and as you can see, the blue and the blue in the bottom, you can see that there's uh, some of the benefits that distinguish printed and digital BLs. Um, and I think one of the principal ones is that it's really um, a cost saver. It really allows for greater accuracy, and it means that um, there's greater reliability in the system. Next. I saw that there was a question that was raised about the, the EBR declaration. Um, I think I don't have time to really go into this, but uh, FIATA is a part of the FIT Alliance um, together with DCSA, BIMCO, ICC and SWIFT. And last week they launched the declaration of the electronic bill of lading. If you would like to find out more, then please go to www.fit-alliance.org and join us in signing the EBR declaration to really signal a uh, signal um, the commitment to digital change in the supply chain. Next. Um, so uh, I think that uh, my colleagues have really gone through a lot of the work that has been done at the UNSATRA level um, and on the MLETR. So I won't go into this. I um, so I would just say that Fiatta is working very much and is very committed to working on these different projects. And I think one thing that is very important is to ensure that um, we can find it an international framework that does have this harmonization and does provide the certainty um, to ensure that there is this coordination and conciliation between um, even irrespective of the underlying um, other regulatory regime, regimes that are um, on going throughout the different modes of transport and throughout the different jurisdictions um, and having this ability to have this uh, negotiable um, multimodal bill of lading or multimodal ca cargo document, um, which is envisaged by the Antichar project, would be really um, uh, important for facilitating international trade. Next. So um, we are very much focused on collaborating with the different stakeholders to facilitate data exchange. Um, we've, I talked about the digital identity and I think that having this trusted network which has been developed through the digital identity is really crucial to being able to ensure the success of um, digital initiatives going forward because it's important that now as data is being exchanged even faster and even more efficiently and even more freely through the, through the digital sphere, that stakeholders are feeling comfortable and that there is this, um, that their data is being have, uh, governed and being handled in a trustworthy manner. And also that then the, it, it allows for them to also have greater trust in the supply chain by knowing that the document that they're dealing with is, um, um, is an authentic document. Um, and to really facilitate this trust, we've also developed um, some key data governance principles. So you can see this on the FIATA website um, under practical guides and in our resources section where you can see FIATA's data governance charter, which is developed in collaboration with the Global Shippers Forum. Um, and finally, just um, to ensure to, to um, underline the need to ensure that digitalization can really facilitate accessibility for SMEs and rather than hinder it. So um, we're really working to ensure inclusive and accessible industry solutions. Um, next, I think this is now my one of my final slides now, but just to say that uh, we encourage um, a very much support for FIATA's work um, and please do feel free to, to subscribe to FIATA communication channels for the latest news and to consult FIATA's best practice guides and share information and guidance with, um, with, with your members and with your industry peers. And finally, um, next, um, we will be in Brussels for FIATA's FIATA World Congress 2023 on the 3rd to 6th of October, where we will also discuss many of these topics a little bit more in detail. So please if, if feel free to uh, register. Um, you, I have the um, event link there, fiatas2023.com. So if you would like to join us there, then we'll be very happy to have you. So I hope that I didn't take up too much time, but that's um, more or less my presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Andrea Tang. So uh, because we are running out of the time, I will be closing the session. Thank you very much for all the speakers and apologies once again for the technical hiccups, but let me pass on to the MC once again. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kim, for moderating an interesting and lively discussion and to our panelists for the interesting insights. 
at this point, we would like to invite our moderator and speakers to take a group photo. Um, for the virtual speakers, we respectfully request uh, you to keep your camera on. And for in-person speakers, we shall be grateful if you can take on the stage. Just one mo moment, we will have our virtual speakers on the screen. One moment, please. Yes. Thank you. Um, one, two, three. One more. One, two, three. Okay. Thank you so much for our moderator and speakers. <laughs> so that concludes our panels for today. I trust that each of you have benefited from today's discussions on these increasingly relevant topics. Before we delve into our coffee highlights, which is a discussion on the use of NFT for electronic bills of lading, we will have a very brief uh, five minute coffee break. Um, we invite you to help yourself for coffee and tea and return to the conference room in five minutes. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, we hope that you have had an opportunity to get some refreshments. We now invite everybody to return to the conference room so that we can commence with our special coffee highlights event. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Hyung Kyung Lee as our moderator for this um, session. As a research professor, Dr. Lee lectures in the fields of commercial law, financial law, and maritime law at both Korea University and Hanam University. Additionally, Dr. Lee holds research positions at the Korea Legal Research Institute and the Korean Law Institute and is an executive director at the Korean Maritime Law Association. Dr. Lee, we are grateful to have you as the moderator here today to moderate this highlight on the use of NFT for electronic bills of lading. Um, this session starts at 3.15 um, and will finish at um, 3.55. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for kind introduction. I'm, uh, it's my great honor to be moderator at Coffee Highlight Session and great to meet you all audience and all participants. Our session Coffee Highlight named NFT using a use of NFT for electronic bill of lading is a real business topic about Korea business company. Uh, in fact, uh, Korea is pioneer country to uh, inter uh, al already introduce uh, electronic bureau of lading provision in 2007. However, and then, uh, however, since then the actual utilization is has not been so much because of trade threat practice or legislation problem and non preference of shipping logistic company and insurance compensation problem. Meanwhile, as although Winstra recently enacted MLETR in 2017 and blockchain technology is development, uh, so various overseas company uh, activity underway in electronic bill of lading. In the background, the Korea company also so many research project and pilot pro project. So we great, uh, we honored to invited two presenters from KTNet and POSCO International who are actively leading this discussion from uh, in Korea business area. Uh, let me introduce first speaker, Ms. Chemi Kim, CDO uh, Executive Director uh, from KTNet, uh, who will give a present title, X of Next Trade Facilitation. Uh, please give applause to welcome first speaker presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's my honor to share new challenges of trade facilitation uh, with the digital experience by KTNet and POSCO International in this UNCITRA forum. We are still on the journey looking for unknown puzzle X of innovative trade facilitation experience to Korean trade community. This is Chemi Kim, Executive Director of KTNet. I have been working for trade facilitation for 30 years. <laughs> From EDI of UN EDFEC, XML UN CEFEC, to generative AI and blockchain. Now focusing on new business model and K-Trade digital framework development. Today, 
I'd like to share with you about digital experience uh, compliant to trade facilitation uh, legal framework. Let me share roadmap and barriers to overcome, then talk about the story of our challenge and conclude with a forward uh, looking and thinking for trade facilitation governance. Let me start the exciting journey with you. Since 1991, we had achieved successful performance on the paper trade, handling more than 800 trade logistics finance documents. This was a trade facilitation 1.0. Since 2010, we stepped into the digital platform-based trade facilitation 2.0 data-driven digital trade, not just trade documents. Open API and digital platform with big data and AI are supporting to keep multilateral relation by connect, share, and flow on the long-term transaction. Unfortunately, one of the very traditional document, bill of lading, has a limitation to be digitalized on the global trade uh, transaction without equal mutual recognition compared with paper form. Nevertheless, the technology is moving to Web 3.0, realizing autonomous uh, trade beyond the digital trade. We are here way forward to trade facilitation 3.0. While going forward to the next level, we should handle with chronic problems, even on the digital platform. Some of original title paper documents are still delivered by Air Express. Document handling cost and time are far from seamless trade streamlining process. Commonly invoice packing list from email attached file, original BL, paper by courier service for negotiation, certificate origin, and testing report paper form submission. Over this uh, problem, we should prepare new emerging technical barriers more. The related risk is rapidly increasing against resilient global supply chain, and seamless trade facilitation. Within a few years, from the full value chain's perspective, we should be ready to have a data-driven, self-proof capability for each of product items. On this reuse, remanufacturing, recycle, circular economy, we must handle scope three data on the hyper-connected digital value chain. It is the next level of data-driven digital trade by trade regulation. Uh, last year, we had a meaningful moment, a grand opening ceremony of U-Trade Hub 2.0. The main concept of a new major version upgrade is data-driven digital platform, connecting U-Trade Hub trade community with the u Logist Hub logistic players. We add trade flow, hyper-connected service handling documents as a data and process. I'm so proud of this successful second big step Four years effort with my colleagues, I was very lucky to have a double experience putting my idea and effort into both Utrade Hub 1.0 and 2.0. Now we are talking new exciting baby step to serve what is X for the next level of trade facilitation with the global trade partners. This is 
innovative baby step footprint. Uh, first, for domestic business model, testing report and certification by digital document wallet. A second, for import freight, must, and house delivery order by console for water, warehouse, and transport driver. Third, for export freight, EBL full life cycle service this year for export to import data driven autonomous cross border trade declaration. Uh, today, I'd like to elaborate the third one ETR POC with the POSCO International. This pilot ETR project was sponsored by NIPA research funding under Ministry of Science and ICT. We adopted emerging NFT non-fungible token to electronic bill of rating on open account transaction. In order to build a new concept of ETR, one of the most important milestone was to be compliant to global standard and specification. We built a multilateral global consortium with exporter, importer, shipper, bank, insurance company for ETR full cycle implementing multiple holder transport of EBL. KTNet and POSCO International decided to run this ETR project on the real export transaction from Korea through Canada to USA. Export containers stopped with automobile parts, departed in the end of last October, and arrived in the last November. Almost one month long transaction including three weeks ocean carrier and with a mask and one week inland transportation. For legal compliance, uh, UNSTRAL ML ETR was the basic framework for functional equivalence and process of ETR. 15 years ago, Korea was prepared to have EBA legal framework on the domestic level. Unfortunately, it was not cross-border recognition level, very limited to export scenario on domestic EBA creation and conditional transition from EBA to paper for interoperable uh, cross-border trade. EBL has the same legal position with uh, paper under commercial law in 2008 and EBL regulation on implementation in 2013. Very early adopter, <laughs> like another field. Article 7, uh, transition from document to ETR, chapter 4, cross-border recognition were missing in this domestic legal scheme at that time. Smart contract on blockchain was applied for functional equivalence and use of ETR. Initial smart contract ETR create, set up blockchain asset for ETR from BL data. Next, smart contract NFT mint bind ETR asset to NFT for ETR lifecycle management and NFT transfer from transfer ETR asset to the next holder. After several iteration of transfer, final ETR holder can dispose it by NFT bond smart contract. We can keep the ETR data for 10 years as long as we can control the life cycle until the flow of freight and financial process ended up. 
This is the ETL transfer scenario we had done with the NFT. We get the BL data from MERSC and create ETL asset. And then NFT forced the holder as a POSCO International in Korea. EBL asset holder can be changed according to open account negotiation and freight flow with NFT along with bank, insurance company, finally to import company. ETR patent application was submitted last November. Uh, now is under examination for patent registration. We believe this specific method proven by POC with a blockchain and NFT for ETR is the first trial model and creative method compared with a centralized title registry model. Patent title is management method of ETR for digital trade based on UNCITRA MLETR and system performing the same. <laughs> I'm sure you know the security game. X of next trade facilitation uh, should not be squid game, winner takes all. I hate it. Many platforms should be engaged to complete digital cross-border trade. Three main components of federated trade facilitation are first, legal framework, second, soft trade facilitation commons, and third, hard one. We need for federated governance of commons, including law, consensus among community, standard, and facility infrastructure. For this federated governance model, I referenced the common pool management concept in economics. Uh, Elenia Ostrom, she was the first woman to win the Nobel Prize in economics 2009. From the trade facilitations perspective, we are facing the same problem. First, community has been overgrazed on the dominant platform. Second, lack of interoperability and difficult to collaborate over the fragmented market. Third, major participant adapted to the familiar paper way, not active in the transition stage uh, of innovation and change. Each party of trading should participate actively to set up group of trade facilitation principles with the UNCITRA and domestic institution as a long enduring organization to set up core resource governance principles of trade facilitation. In Korea, KTNet has a hyper-connected community on the paper is trade community network. Uh, Utrade Hub has uh, 100,000 trade users you, Logist Hub has uh, 12,000 logistics companies uh, use handling over half, half billion transactions per year. Now it's time to jump up on this valuable stepping stone with the global partners powered by Federation for the next level of trade facilitation. Thanks a lot for listening our new challenges and vision to be X for the next trade facilitation. I hope to find out uh, our super X together. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chemi Kim. Uh, in Korea, to be an electronic PR trade platform, uh, they have to register from Minister of Justice by Korea Commercial Code. In Korea, just two, KTNet and KLNet 
is registered agency in Korea. Uh, KTNet is first registered in Korea. So KTNet uh, played an important role in electronic bill of lading in Korea. Uh, I hope um, KTNet's business innovation is expected to contribute greatly to uh, activation of electronic bill of lading in Korea in future. Uh, thank you, Ms. Chen Kim. Uh, sec uh, let's move on. Second speaker is Mr. Chen Chandler Yoon, head of DX team Postco International, uh, who will giving a uh, present titled letter to all the cross industry. Please, meet Mr. Yoon. Okay. Ah, uh, good afternoon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Chandler Yun from Postco International, and I have the honor of uh, delivering today's presentation. Uh, today, I would like to share our thoughts as a big consigner of Korea on digital trade practice and the importance of MLETR legislation. Uh, our company, Postco International, is a comprehensive business corporation engaged in trading for a long, long time. In addition to our traditional trading business, so we have expanded uh, into new sectors such as resource development, eco-friendly renewable energy, and overseas investment, positioning ourselves as leaders uh, in green energy and global business. Have you heard about uh, Korean word miseng? In English, uh, so-called uh, incomplete life. It was a popular uh, Korean webtoon about 10 years ago but uh, it realistically depicts uh, the struggles of a newbie uh, joining a general trading company. It was even uh, made into a drama with some scenes filmed at our company at that time. So let's take a quick look at a scene from the drama. Okay. Uh, uh, ironically, uh, even in this uh, technologically advanced 21st century, so we still face challenges uh, caused by small human errors that can have significant impact on our business operation. In addition, we also confront long-standing challenges such as the potential for fraud uh, through document forgery or alternation, the burden of excessive paperwork, and the uh, need to reduce our carbon footprint uh, by reducing the use of paper. According to an international report, uh, trade damage from crimes like uh, fraud is more than 10 times greater than uh, trade damage from lost cargoes itself. Uh, to address the company's risks and uh, inefficiencies, our top management decided uh, to create a task force team for digital project. The so a comprehensive analysis of our business operations involving approximately uh, 50,000 bill of lading and about 7,000 letters of credit handled annually, we identified the digitalization of uh, bill of lading and letter of credit as a priority task. Our trade volumes are expected to continue to grow. But this delay in creating a digital trade environment will only make our work more inefficient in the future. Uh, to tackle these uh, internal challenges and create a global digital trade environment, so we embarked on a long journey last year. We soon realized that uh, we could not achieve this environment alone as a consigner company. Uh, thus, uh, we collaborated with linked-minded partners at home and abroad, so including EBL platforms utilizing blockchain solutions, uh, shipping lines issuing bill of lading, uh, banks uh, accepting e-documents for letter of credit transactions, uh, insurance companies uh, covering new and hidden risks, and governmental agencies are uh, working on legal framework to establish and improve such an ecosystem. For the first time, so we participated in the uh, Ministry of Science and ICT's uh, blockchain demonstration project uh, in uh, collaboration with uh, KTNet. So as delivered right before by Ms. Kim from KTNet about this, so we provided a technical verification for a secure electronic document distribution. 
Last December, so we successfully complete uh, this project uh, by connecting trade range and our POC platform uh, to issue and distribute a real-time electronic uh, BL to our US uh, Detroit subsidiary. Uh, early this year, I visited Japan uh, to study how they are creating a digital trade environment. Uh, during my visit to the Japanese Trade Watch platform, uh, we discussed uh, potential partnerships uh, with the POC platform we had developed. Uh, this visit also provided a great insight uh, into how the Japanese government is supporting uh, digital trading and their future plans. Uh, in February, uh, we participated in a seminar attended by a legal academic uh, specialist in domestic and international commerce. So we presented uh, the result of last year's uh, POC project and exchanged uh, views on the needs uh, for legal preparations to promote digital trade. So we highlighted the lack of recognition for uh, rulebook-based overseas platforms in domestic Korean uh, commercial law and the challenges of uh, distributing EBLs issued by uh, domestic EBL uh, designated uh, registers overseas. We extensively considered uh, commercializing our POC platform and implementing it with major functions in trade, uh, logistics, and finance. However, uh, the project was eventually dropped uh, due to concerns about uh, immediate uh, business profit uh, profitability with huge amount of investment and the lack of uh, marketing strategy uh, for overseas distribution. Last June, uh, we uh, invited overseas platform companies as stocks and contour to Korea. So we together met uh, nine commercial banks and six logistics companies to encourage their participation. Uh, while most of the companies we met uh, expressed optimistic about the future, but concerns about the legal uh, ambiguity of e-document issued by uh, overseas platforms and the perception of uh, difficulty in immediate uh, profit generation hindered uh, significant progress. So given the challenges of uh, creating a digital trade environment, the only way to safely execute uh, the transaction immediately uh, was to issue and distribute the transaction to our overseas uh, subsidiary directly uh, through a domestic EBL issuance platform. So we are currently improving our system and uh, process uh, among participants uh, to facilitate uh, transactions starting in this October. So our goal is to process transactions uh, from Korean headquarters uh, to Japanese subsidiary uh, using uh, electronic document uh, issued uh, directly by shipping companies uh, through the KL uh, EBL platform, which is a designated company under the uh, Korean commercial law uh, for EBL issuance. Uh, throughout this journey, so we were able to uh, synthesize the experiences and uh, perspectives of all the cross industries. Uh, export shippers uh, expressed concerns about uh, what would happen if the counter importers uh, didn't accept the e document packages. The logistics companies, including Shipping Line, so inquired about the risk uh, associated with uh, circulating uh, EBL. Overseas platform mentioned that they can distribute e document according to their own rule books, even if it uh, deviates from Korean commercial law. However, uh, shippers and banks remain wary of the legal ambiguity. Uh, banks explained uh, their challenges in addressing such issues uh, due to their conservative nature and numerous uh, regulations. The insurance industry stated that they can only cover the risk uh, associated with using traditional paper BL. So Korean platforms uh, face obstacles in figuring out how to monetize uh, by EBL digital trade. So then uh, now only one question remains. How are we able to create a digital trade environment in Korea? And what should be the first step? So many individuals, uh, including myself, so who experience these matters, uh, believe 
that the initial step towards uh, ensuring the safety of uh, digital trade for all industry adapt uh, domestic legislation uh, capturing the essence of MLETR. Uh, such legislation would provide a fertile ground uh, for the growth of digital trade ecosystem. The government must read and support the private sector in creating uh, public goods markets that are difficult to establish through uh, market failure. A continued uh, investment is crucial uh, to ensure the domestic markets interoperability uh, with advanced digital trade environment abroad. Uh, back in the day uh, when I was living in Singapore as an expat, I got a new Singaporean drive uh, license. So during that time, I uh, occasionally uh, drove my car across the border to Malaysia for a trip. So I couldn't drive in Malaysia with uh, my Korea license but i could uh, with my singaporean driver's license so that's because the uh, two countries uh, have agreed to legally recognize uh, each other's uh, licenses so we all know uh, that if you have an international driver's license so we can drive anywhere in the countries that uh, have an agreement so my insight, uh, the concept of ML ETL functions is as same as an international driver's license for digital trade. So I strongly believe that Koreans participate pay, pay, patient in ML ETL so will play a significant role in establishing a robust uh, digital trade environment. So um, so for this concludes my uh, presentation. So thank you for listening. Yeah. Give a big hand to Ms. Chandler. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chandler. Uh, one, one is the biggest obstacle for the electronic bill of lading is non-preference of logist, ocean logistic company. Uh, pioneer Company, logistic company Postco International's effort uh, made uh, activation in Korea electronic bureau of ratings. Uh, I have uh, one question uh, for sub two presenter. Uh, I already mentioned various obstacles to electronic bureau of rating in Korea. Uh, what is the most difficult things about preference for the electronic bureau of rating business? Uh, why electronic bill of lading has not been activated in Korea? Uh, can you, uh, I do appreciate it if you could simply answer. Mm, I like to point out two perspective. First one, from the user's perspective, uh, many fragmented platform, lack of interoperability and seamless service. They cannot receive seamless service. And uh, transition period, we have uh, electronized and digitalized have uh, many gaps between them. But uh, during that time, uh, transition period, uh, partly digitalized uh, status, they cannot satisfy to stay on the transition period. And second, uh, EBL service providers perspective, we have a, a typical three model. First one is a centralized registry like a Bolero. And second, decentralized ledger like a trade brands. And third one is token-based uh, EBL. Uh, this guarantees some kind of uh, interoperable transfer. Uh, circulation is the key. So maybe uh, technically it's not important, but uh, from the service provider's uh, perspective and user's perspective, uh, EBL, uh, MLETI, have to be uh, circularized on the global level. Uh, if I log in some platform, I have to send 
uh, 100 countries and any car ocean carriers, any bank, any insurance company, we have to provide uh, interoperability, but it's not easy task. So it's not only Korean problem, it's a global issue. Yes. Thank you. How so, about Mr. Chandra? Okay. Uh, in, my, in my opinion, if uh, the moment comes, I mean, the business uh, become uh, profitable. So everyone in the private sector uh, will actively participate in uh, digitalization. So even if the environment is created, uh, shipping companies and banks uh, do not think uh, that uh, they can uh, differentiate and exclude themselves as a profitable business. So this is due to the public good nature of EBL, and there um, seems to be a sense of a crisis that the traditional business model of issuing paper BL and discounting letters of credit uh, will be lost due to digitalization. A domestic EBL platform companies uh, seems to be slowed uh, to gather, gather uh, platforms uh, participants. So they may uh, find it difficult to attract that uh, many participants in a short period of time. So large shippers are working uh, initially. Uh, they think that uh, creating a digital trade environment is not their job. So, but the job of shipping lines, uh, banks, government, etc. So the bottom line is that uh, no one in the private sector is taking the lead. So my short opinion is that the government uh, should uh, legislate the MLETR first and set the stage for public-private uh, uh, partnership to push for a digital trade environment. The government uh, should actively uh, intervene uh, to solve a market failure that will hinder trade facilitation such as uh, subsidizing the cost of uh, computerization improvements for shipping companies, so providing initial incentives uh, for companies who are adapting EBO in the beginning, so providing earlier uh, protection for domestic platforms to read uh, domestic business from competition from overseas platforms, and covering new risks uh, with uh, public insurance. I believe that the uh, uh, private sector will not hesitate to join the movement if they do not have to spend much or their own money to create a, a digital trade environment or if it uh, becomes profitable to participate in uh, the business. So I think the uh, trade agenda should be uh, elevated to the level of a national task uh, to drive it uh, forward because it is at the core of a, a country's economy. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I apologize it to all audience to skip the floor discussion. I'm very sorry to uh, our learning time is out. Uh, POSCO and KTNS uh, effort to internet uh, electronic bureau of ratings made uh, Korean electronic bureau of rating business successful, I, I hope that. And our session is uh, running out and we wrap up the, this session. Thank you for all audience and all participating. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee, Ms. Kim, and Mr. Yu, for introducing us to the issues surrounding the use of NFT. Before concluding, um, we will be most grateful if our speakers could approach the stage to take a photograph. One, two, three. One more. One, two, three. Thank you. We hope that everyone attending, both virtually and in person, have found today's sessions to be informative and enriching. We will have one last special event for the day. But first, I would like to welcome to the stage and introduce Ms. Adita Kominda who will deliver concluding remarks to today's events. As head of the Ancestral Regional Center for Asia and Pacific, Athita manages technical assistance and capacity building program 
available to over 50 states in Asia and the Pacific, coordinates with governments and international and regional organizations on trade law reform activities, and manages programs to promote the rule of law in commerce aimed at achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. Asita, please. Thank you very much, Tracy. I, I think your introduction will be longer than my very short concluding remarks. So I just wanted to say hello to everyone. Um, greetings to all in person and virtual participants on the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center Zoom and PKU Law broadcast with AI generated Chinese subtitle translation. I wanted to say hello and express the highest appreciation of the Antitrust Secretariat, including that of my office the Regional Center for Asia and the Pacific, which is located right here in Songdo, five minutes from, from our venue. So without your support and contributions over these Tuesdays, these, uh, this event would not have been possible. And in fact, as of now, this edition of the Incheon Law and Business Forum has the most participants of any iteration since the flagship series was launched in 2019 reportedly numbering over 1,000 participants as of this morning from all over the world. Uh, some overarching logistical updates. As we've received many questions on this, please note that all UNCITRAL texts, including on digital trade and electronic commerce, are available in the six United Nations official languages at uncitral.un.org. Links have been placed in the Zoom chat box for the benefit of our virtual audience. In addition, the event recordings and presentation materials, presuming speaker consent, will be uploaded onto the event page on the UNCITRAL website in due course. Thank you again, and please enjoy today's special event and the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Athita, for those concluding remarks. Before we close out for the day, I would like to introduce one final special event to mark the launch of the United Nations Center for Trade Facilitation and E-Business White Paper on Transfer of Melita Compliant Titles. We have two speakers with us in this session to address us on this special event. It is firstly my pleasure to introduce Ms. Kamola Kuznodinova, who is joining us online, as Kamola is the Acting Secretary for the United Nations Center for Faith for trade facilitation and e-business. I can think of no person better placed to speak to the significance of this white paper. Thank you, Kamola. The floor is yours. Uh, many thanks. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you well. Great. And uh, just to confirm whether you can see my screen as well with the presentation. Can you see my screen? Yes, it's perfect. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for confirming. And and many thanks for this opportunity to contribute to the 2023 Incheon Law and Business Forum and for hosting this uh, special event uh, dedicated to the launch of um, the UNC Fact White Paper on Transfer of MLETR Compliant Titles. Apologies that I couldn't join you in person due to conflicting commitments here in Geneva. My name is Kamola Husnudinova. And I work at the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, UNECE, which is one of five regional commissions of the UN Secretariat. Uh, let me start my slides. So before I start talking about the UNC fact activities, uh, let me share a brief overview of the organization which I'm representing. UNECE mandated with developing trade facilitation recommendations and electronic business standards host the Secretariat of the UN Center for Trade Facilitation and Electronic Business, which I have been leading since last year. The Secretariat is hosted in the Trade Facilitation section of the Economic Cooperation and Trade Division, which covers two sub-programs consisting of four sections. The work of UNEC covers three pillars, normative, policy advice, and technical assistance. Every two years, UNEC member states uh, gather at a commission session and discuss, among other things, a cross-cutting uh, priority theme, uh, which shape up uh, commission strategic goals for the next two years. 
The theme of the 69th session, which was held in 21, was promoting circular economy in the region. And the theme of the 70th session was digital and green transformations for sustainable development which uh, sets the agenda for um, the commission for the next two years, 23 and 24. Uh, UNCFAC's work is extremely relevant uh, to both of these topics and it aligns with these priority areas. And these are only a few examples of how it contributes to this agenda. In the recent years, we have been supporting countries in addressing disruption of supply chains caused by the pandemic and geopolitical tensions and enhancing resilience and sustainability of supply chains through developing and deploying global standards and digital solutions, as well as enhancing traceability and transparency along value chains. Now about UNCVAC. The UN Center for Trade Facilitation and Electronic Business is an intergovernmental body of the UNEC with a global mandate and global membership Anybody can participate free of charge in the work of UNCFAC. We have a pool of 1,600 experts from public and private sector. UNCFAC dedicates its work to simplifying and harmonizing international trade and electronic business processes through efficient and automated exchange of information. There's a wide range of uh, the deliverables in UNC fact, and um, there's a number of electronic business standards, recommendations, guidelines, training materials that are available uh, on the website. And we also do targeted advisory services to countries. For example, development of uh, national trade facilitation roadmaps. To date, uh, UNC fact developed uh, nearly 950 electronic business standards and close to 50 policy recommendations. And this is, of course, um, done by the community of expert glo experts globally. Now, uh, our uh, collaboration with uh, the standard setting organizations, we have uh, developed uh, partnerships with many of them, and we collaborate closely with the UN agencies and uh, specialized uh, uh, programs uh, developing uh, standards. And the comparative advantage of UNC fact is that it ensures interoperability and harmonization across the entire international supply chain and all modes of transport. Uh, and uh, the work of UNC fact is extensively referenced by partner organization. And just a few examples that it was uh, in the past few years uh, referenced in a number of the WTO uh, toolkits and, and papers, as well as in the recent uh, WTO World Economic Forum report, the EU strategies and uh, some in directives, as well as the uh, most recent DCSA announcement of the standards of the Bill of Lading. Here's also a, a number of the UN agencies we call, collaborate with, as well as the private organizations, the business associations, and the uh, European uh, Commission and regional uh, initiatives. Uh, now, if we want to deep dive into a more uh, technical work, uh, you see that uh, we also we uh, the core of uh, the UNC FLAC work is developing e-business standards, and there's a number of those that are available free of charge for downloading from our website. And uh, here are a few examples of the standards supporting uh, electronic business such as a core component library, reference data models. Um, there's a number of business requirement specifications available for uh, using and uh, many, many more standards. And most recently the JSON LD, which uh, is also uh, progressing very well. Uh, now, in terms of the technical cooperation activities, we do a lot of work jointly with partners. There's a UN uh, development account projects that are ongoing. Most recently, uh, there has been the fifth launch of the UN Global, the fifth edition um, uh, has been launched of the UN Global Survey on Digital and Sustainable Trade Facilitation. This is an initiative implemented jointly with um, five regional commissions as well as uh, with UNCTAD. And uh, we have been implementing an EU-funded project for enhancing 
traceability and transparency of sustainable value chains and garment and footwear. And also we do uh, capacity building activities uh, and advisory services to the countries, especially to the 17 uh, program countries in the UNECE region, which are the beneficiaries uh, of our um, capacity building activities. Uh, now more on the survey that I have um, mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, this survey is uh, covering 160 economies and the 60 digital and sustainable trade facilitation measures, including two new sets of measures uh, of this year on trade facilitation for e-commerce and also uh, wildlife trade facilitation. Uh, the set of measures uh, of the survey uh, also includes those featured in the World Trade Organization's trade facilitation agreement and it greatly contributes to raising awareness on UNC fact recommendations, which constitute the basis of um, our technical assistance activities. You will see from this chart that globally, the implementation rate rose from 63% in 2021 to 69% this year. And in UNEC region that covers 56 member states, implementation rate has also improved from 76 to 80 percent. Uh, and also in the SPECA region, SPECA region is the special economies of Central um, of Central Asia. Uh, it has also improved by uh, three percent. Uh, I'm not going to go into details, but you, 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 there's a link also provided on the slide, which can be accessed for uh, information on the performance of uh, any of the 160 states um, that are covered uh, by the survey. Uh, now, one of the ways of supporting countries uh, is uh, helping them with the implementation of the WTO TFA, as mentioned earlier. And on this slide, you will see that we have uh, put together a detailed mapping of UNCFAC recommendations, standards, and guidelines that support relevant trade facilitation measures, including institutional arrangements uh, and cooperation, cross-border paperless trade, as well as agricultural trade facilitation. Uh, also, it uh, supports implementation uh, of the least implemented measures, uh, which represent challenges related to information available through internet, uh, use of international standards, single window implementation, and others. Um, now, this is uh, another example of the uh, capacity building activity, which is an e-learning platform. Uh, it is aimed at uh, better supporting member states and building capacity on trade facilitation. And uh, also, I'm not going to go into details, but it has a number of uh, case studies, learning material, um, the repository of the UNCFAC deliverables, which uh, can be accessed through this interactive online platform. This brings me now to the slide on the white paper, which, uh, um, uh, which uh, the, the speaker after me will present in more details, uh, Mr. Ren UK. But I will just mention that it was um, uh, launched just recently, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, and it was a result of a great collaboration of experts in UNC Fact. This is a deliverable of one of our 30 projects. And uh, this white paper is looking at um, it, the, the goal of the white paper is to develop a framework and guidance on how to achieve the requirement outlined in the MLETR for electronic transferable records. And it also takes into consideration the issues of uh, reliability. And uh, this uh, paper, this guidance material looks in the details of uh, how Distributor, distributed ledger technology could be used, and as well how the existing UNC fact uh, deliverables could also be um, beneficial in this concept. So I will um, let the uh, speaker after me, Mr. Ren Yuhke, to to cover more details of this uh, white paper. And I congratulate. I take this opportunity also to congratulate him and the team on uh, uh, successfully delivering uh, this paper. And this brings me to the final slide, which I want to to just um, bring your attention to the upcoming events of the UNC fact. Um, we, the, the expert community um, comes together twice a year 
to discuss the progress on the projects and activities and to uh, decide on potential new initiatives and new projects. And um, this is called the UNC Fact Forum. We just had the, the most recent UNC Fact Forum in May in Geneva, which was very successful. We had over 300 people in person. We had over 35 um, sessions during the whole week. Uh, and uh, the next one is uh, planned for October. And it will be in Bangkok this time, and it will be uh, um, held jointly with our sister commission, ESCAP. So I invite you, uh, those who are interested, to register for the forum. You see the QR code on the screen, which is um, which has the registration details and also the details on the sessions and the program. So this is something that um, we will be uh, we look forward to hosting very soon. Uh, and uh, another um, activity that will uh, take place this year is the UNC Fact Plenary, which will uh, be held in Geneva. That, but this is um, a um, the governing body of uh, of uh, UNC Fact. So this this is where the uh, decisions are taken on uh, the deliverables of projects on the strategic directions of UNC Fact. Um, it's not uh, an, an open session, but just to um, give you an idea that this is uh, where uh, we're headed for the next uh, plenary session and um, also looking forward to uh, taking place this year. Um, now, here's again is a QR code for the registration and also a QR code to the UNC FACT website where you can um, get free access to uh, all of the deliverables that I had mentioned uh, in the previous slides. Uh, if there's any questions that um, I could answer, you please, uh, you're welcome to um, reach out to me via the email that you have on the screen. And with this, I think my 14 minutes allocated to the um, to, to my intervention are up. So I will um, pass the floor back to the moderator and thank you very much for, for your attention and I'll be happy to answer um, any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kamola, for the interesting presentation. Last but not least, let me introduce our second speaker for this special event, who is also the last speaker of the day, Mr. Ren Yun K, who is an assistant director in the Trade Trust Digital Utilities Cluster the Toro Transformation Group of the Infocom Media Development Authority in Singapore. Thank you for joining us again, Mr. K. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for sticking around. Uh, the special uh, surprise that I prepared for you earlier, that will come after this. Yeah, so just bear with me for a little while longer, yeah? Okay, so um, even though I uh, am indeed from the Infocom Media Development Authority, it was not in that capacity that I contributed at UNC Fact. As you've no doubt uh, heard from Komola, we all contribute in our personal capacities, and we do this uh, for the well for the betterment of the trade community. I am very proud uh, to have uh, spent uh, all this time together with many many experts from around the world on this topic, and today uh, this is the occasion of our launch of the UNC FACT MLETR compliant title transfer uh, white paper. Um, so what exactly is this white paper? Uh, it, well, it provides clear guidance. Okay, because the MLETR, the MELITA, yeah? MELITA, uh, due to the fact that it is uh, technologically neutral, uh, it phrases or it outlines the, re, the functional requirements, but it is up to the practitioners to figure out how to achieve those requirements. And it's not really just uh, achieving them um, uh, a binary yes or no. How you achieve them also has practical implications uh, on the community. Uh, so case in point, um, in our paper, we talk about two methods to achieve singularity. You could have a centralized database or you could have a decentralized ledger. As implementers, your choice of either is going to impact your users, 
is going to impact their business partners and impact the overall community as a whole. So it is important to really have a view or to consider uh, very carefully um, which choice you make uh, uh, in your and make sure that you hopefully will um, deal with the consequences of that choice. Right. OK, so we are um, OK, so because using centralized databases uh, has been well uh, possible for many, many years now. Uh, so in this white paper, we contextualize it towards two things. First of all, DLT, and second, uh, electronic negotiable bills of lading. Um, in USC fact, white papers have a capacity page limit of 20 or thereabouts. That is the reason why we have to be very laser focused on um, our topic. Okay, um, so we have we look at it from that, those two perspectives. We look at how the existing UNC fact deliverables come into play for negotiable electronic bills of lading and key issues to consider. Okay, so just in case uh, you are still wondering uh, why should we bother to digitalize negotiable bills of lading? Um, well, even though we had UNC fact recommendation 12 in 2011, uh, that was more for CUA bills, i.e. non-negotiable uh, and, and, and non-negotiable instrument. So when we look at it from uh, the perspective of what is the, what is the difference we are aiming to make, uh, easiest is to look at what is today and what is possible in the future. Uh, we are looking at negotiable electronic bills of lading that can truly, truly, truly be interoperable or maybe even portable right across different systems. Um, we believe by removing all this friction from the international trade process, we can lower the cost of processing and increase the trust uh, that people will have in these digital means. That is the only way you're going to move away from paper, yeah? because that's the only way you can overcome the inertia um, of human change. Uh, okay, just in case you've been sleeping the whole day, um, a transferable document is, a, is one that entitles the holder to claim delivery of goods or payment of sum of money. Um, and so, it, yeah, uh, people, I mean, for a bill of lading, for example, it's an obligation to perform to deliver goods. Um, if it was a bill of exchange or a promissory note, that's payment of money. Uh, very one slide recap of, the, of Melita. It's an international standard on electronic functional equivalent of a paper transferable instrument or document. And it is intended to help reduce existing problems with digitalization through harmonization. Um, so the key thing when it comes to paper instruments, so you have the requirements of unique, original possession and, and document delivery. If you now split into two, you've got the ETR as a functional equivalent of the unique original. That's the, the first two. And then control as the functional equivalent of possession, the third one. Okay, so now that all that uh, context or background is out of the way, uh, coming to the actual white paper itself, um, this was uh, something that the project group worked together with, uh, you know, fairly uniquely two UNC fact vice chairs. It's actually very rare to have one project that has the attention of uh, two or more uh, vice chairs. Um, and you are actually, uh, uh, there have been, there are so many uh, experts that uh, co collaborated with uh, uh, together on this. Um, even among, even in this room, uh, Luca, who is sitting here, uh, uh, you know, uh, turned up at almost every meeting to, uh, to contribute his valuable expertise and context uh, from being the secretariat of the working group four uh, that did the MLETR. Uh, and we also had the um, contributions 
of many of the uh, leading academics in this area. Uh, in addition to those, uh, we also had private sector participants uh, coming from the solution providers, coming from uh, practitioners uh, who were interested and determined to see that real good neutral guidance was provided. Okay, so um, what follows is really, uh, okay, so number one, um, this white paper is actually already on the UNC FACT site. It's been uploaded yesterday, so hot off the press, so to speak. Um, so you can go down there and download. The link is at the end of the slides. Um, okay, so what did we cover? Well, with the usual context of in chapter two, we covered the business case for digitalizing the bill of lading. I shan't go into that because, yeah. Uh, we looked at what is the current process, looking at it in the terms of how the paper bill of lading serves as a proof of identity, proof of integrity, proof of orig origin, and proof of existence. So that's, well, good for the paper world. Uh, and then we looked at, uh, continue to look at why should we digitalize uh, this document? Uh, what was so difficult about just making it, paper, uh, you know, making it digital from paper? Uh, so we contextualize it in terms of uh, international trade, right? Multiple parties who are mutually distrustful. Um, data is uh, coming from all over the place. Um, COVID-19 certainly taught us that you can't assume that you can get into physical contact or physical proximity, uh, you know, uh, uh, henceforth. Um, pointed out that many current statute legislation, right, uh, requires collateral in paper, it was slow, so on and so forth. So really we wanted to provide guidance on implementation. Now, this is where we start getting into the meat of the paper, right? So chapter three, uh, we looked at the specific um, requirements. So there was a requirement for writing, signature, integrity, uh, very, very crucially, singularity. Uh, I think the, the writing, signature, integrity, the, this is not rocket science. It's been proven uh, or it's been supported earlier. Uh, singularity is really the key one. Uh, alongside that, of course, uh, once you have something that's singular, then you need, that's how you enforce uh, exclusive control, right? Okay, um, and we looked at the use of tokenization uh, to do that. I understand uh, uh, the previous panel uh, also dealt with uh, tokenization for, for bill of leading. Um, we talked about a specific standard uh, Ethereum ERC721 uh, as the standard for an NFT, uh, which allowed exclusive control and prevented double spending. Uh, we looked at uh, the specific uh, conditions of uh, delivery and endorsement, uh, and very crucially also that MLETR uh, uh, accounts for or, or provides, yeah, sorry, provides for the change of medium. Chapter four is a, another uh, 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 say, uh, side of the, of the, of the stake, I guess, uh, looking at it's important that an ETR be able to be verified, but not just you know, uh, verified uh, in terms of authenticity, but also its source. So we talked about uh, WTO TFA article 10.2, uh, the so when you talk about verifiability, it's also in relation to the identity uh, of the issuer. Very importantly, business confidentiality and banking, banking secrecy needs to be uh, upheld. Uh, so over here, just to contextualize it, um, if you run a permission blockchain, a permission ledger, and you control who gets, who can see, great, that's wonderful in terms of protecting your business confidentiality, but it, then it becomes very hard to scale. It becomes very hard to attract more and more uh, companies to, uh, to agree that that is going to be the single source of truth. Um, we also talked about personal data regulation because even though PDP, PDP uh, okay, even though the existing regulations 
uh, say that okay, it's only personal data that needs to be that needs to be uh, protected, uh, and the, and the fact is, given the immutable nature of the blockchain, what happens if potentially the regulation changes to also cover certain business aspects? Then what, what are you going to do? You can't really erase the thing <laughs> that blockchain doesn't really allow you to do that. So it's a specific. A way of implementing blockchain uh, that is provided for. Uh, we talked about you must consider procedural formalities for enforcement. Okay, how a distributed ledger uh, is resistant because uh, if you have a centralized database, if the provider goes down, well, you're screwed. But if it is a distributed ledger that con that has all this information, well, unless you take out the whole world's systems, it, it's going to survive. Uh, we talked about the long-term data preservation uh, uh, consideration. And lastly, in Chapter 5, uh, we shared that, well, we wanted to make sure that people didn't go away thinking that, oh, uh, a ETR is just the electronic variant of a transferable instrument on paper. It's more than that. Why? Because the ML ETR actually supports inclusion of dynamic information. So imagine if uh, sorry imagine that a etr consists of dynamic pieces of information that are that are kept the integrity of of which is kept through technology but yet is a living document yeah so this then is the last uh, uh slide this is the link to the white paper i've i've held you off long enough uh, so right now you can uh, go to this link, download it, and um, put yourself to sleep tonight, uh, reading it. And this is the uh, white paper. Uh, now I get to talk about the uh, special surprise. <laughs> uh, assuming that it will make its way up on the on the screen. I have forty seconds left. Oh, so yeah. Oh dear. Sorry. I'll just scroll through. Okay, apologies. This is. Oh, damn it. Okay, so I thought I'd uh, share with you uh, that um, there's a that Stephenson Harwood, an authoritative uh, legal firm, uh, actually uh, wrote about. Um, the trade trust enabled EBLs and their use in global trade, uh, where there was a comparison of paper bills, contract bills, and trade trust bills. Uh, we looked at the trade trust design uh, under um, the various uh, jurisdictions, uh, the more, MLETR itself, Singapore law, English law, uh, US, New York, and Delaware law. Uh, we also, uh, they also had uh, advice to the market on how to use these bills of lading even in trade that doesn't uh, uh, cover uh, MLETR uh, jurisdictions. Uh, so this will be launched uh, very, very soon in a matter of weeks. We are doing all the beautification right now. So, so please register your interest to be notified via uh, emailing at uh, tradetrust at imda.gov.sg. It will be sent to you free as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's the surprise I uh, wanted to share with you, and I thank you for your attention. So, more reading for material for you in case you have trouble sleeping tonight, yeah? Thank you very much to our two distinguished speakers for sharing your insights into the white paper on transfer of Melita compliant titles. Before concluding this special event, we would like to invite our speakers to take a photo. Um, Ms. Kamola, we shall be grateful if, can, if you can keep your camera on at this moment. And Mr. K, grateful if you can approach the stage. One.
Thank you very much. That concludes our event for today. We hope that every one of you has taken something away from today, and we hope that you will join us again tomorrow for the second day of the Inchon Law and Business Forum. Thank you and have a good evening.